everyone. I'm Alyssa Cooper. I'm the chair of the IETF. And in case you're not sure where you are in this hotel, you're in the plenary. So welcome to the plenary uh, here in, in lovely London. I will say that um, on one of the first days that I was here uh, for this meeting, uh, end of last week, I was trying to figure out where my next uh, meeting was in the in the hotel and walked over to the elevators and uh, was kind of shuffling with my phone, looking at the at the floor plan, and I figured out, okay, I need to be in the West Wing, which is where we are now, um, and then realized I actually don't know which wing I am in at the moment. <laughs> and so I sort of looked up from my phone to see, you know, maybe the wall is going to tell me with the sign which wing I'm in, but of course it, it didn't. Um, but what I did see on the wall was was this sign, and 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 then it became very meta because <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I'm in a sort of maze or labyrinth, if you will, and and that guy is also in a labyrinth. And um, I sort of thought, what is that sign doing here? Like, why am I looking at this guy who's in a labyrinth and I'm in a labyrinth? And it only took a second, but then I realized, of course, that uh, this was part of our, our dear Secretariat's scavenger hunt to help people familiarize themselves uh, with this venue. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank AMS and all of the Secretariat folks for all the support that they provide to the IETF and in the very unique way in which they understand our needs and tailor to them. So thank you very much. And you know, that extends to things like showing up with a leprechaun suit in, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, um, which happened on the weekend in, in case, for those of you who weren't here, um, Alexa was wandering around as a leprechaun, as was I think Stephanie. Um, and she, uh, as you can see, was not wearing a red lanyard and gave me consent to use her photo in the plenary. So um, kudos to AMS. Thank you so much for all that you do for the IETF. Uh, today, we will have our sort of a typical agenda. So um, welcome to the plenary. We will hear from our, um, one of our hosts at this meeting. Um, then we'll have brief updates on hot topics. So as people have seen in the plenaries the last couple of years, we have sent out uh, many reports in advance of the plenary that contain a lot of detail about all the things that are going on in the IETF. And we are attempting to make the plenary presentations um, short and to the point and highlighting um, just the most uh, current issues for the community. So we'll, I will give one of those. We'll have administrative update uh, an update from the IRTF chair, Allison Mankin, uh, hear from the past and incoming uh, NOMCOM chairs, and we will hear from ISOC about the uh, Jonathan B. Postel Award. Then we'll get a bit of a preview of IETF 102 coming up this summer. Uh, we will recognize um, some folks in the community who are uh, transitioning in their uh, status. And then we'll have the technical plenary, um, which I'm very excited about about the future of internet access. We have a bunch of great speakers for you and that's a program that the IAB has put together. And then we'll close out the day with uh, the uh, typical open mic sessions. So first I wanna say a huge thank you to our co-hosts for this meeting, Google and ICANN. Thank you so much for your support of the IETF. We really, um, we, we really could not have the meetings without the hosts, uh, although we occasionally do. They're just not nearly as good. Um, the host plays a really important role, um, not just through their financial support, but um, other uh, logistical and administrative support at the meeting. And um, so we really appreciate that. And now I'd like to ask uh, Euron to come up to the stage. And we're going to hear um, from one of our co-hosts, I can. Don't you feel alone sitting up here by yourself? <laughs> anyway, thank you. I never have in, in, I never have received so many instructions going to any meeting since I started for, for ICANN. 
Uh, I just want to share with you some of them. My first mission here is to make, not, make sure that I don't embarrass my team. Where is my team? Hi, team. <laughs> yeah, they also told me, they, be nice and be yourself. That's contradiction in terms, isn't it? Um, and I didn't, I don't, I don't have to, I, I shouldn't wear a suit and a tie, which most people never see me have anyway, so uh, I don't know what that, I was actually thinking of wearing a suit and a tie, yes, for that. Uh, thank you. I don't know how much you know about ICANN itself uh, or myself, but I actually, I am called the most nerdiest um, CEO of ICANN ever. I have a background in switching, routing, mobile, telecom. But for the last year, I'm now a recovering telecom regulator. So I've seen you know, most things from both sides. But I've never been to an ITF meeting before, so I'm really happy to be here. For me, in a sort of personal way, when people ask me, what is ICANN? And uh, I always start with one sentence, ICANN is not the internet. What we may be is the sort of user interface to the internet for the domain name system. But more importantly, we're a member of an ecosystem. And that ecosystem is you, uh, who does the standardization work. It's ISOC, who does the policy arm. The RERs, who are the numbers community. And from the outside, and I'm not supposed to say this according to my share, we're in this shit together. I didn't say that, did I? Thank you for listening. Um, and that's important to me. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was uh, appointed uh, the CEO, I had the pleasure of going to US Congress to meet um, a guy called Ted Cruz. And one of the things I talked about all the time is in the voluntarily of the system. We do this because it's set up to be voluntarily. We work together because we have to in a voluntarily way. Everybody can sort of walk away and do something different. I don't do this to sell domain names. I do this because I think it's essentially important that the internet stays open and interconnected. I think you have done a great job, all of you, despite all, you even have more acronyms than we have. Yes, you do. You're the winners. But now for the first time, I also see that the things we do together collectively in this ecosystem is threatened. I can give you one example. Um, there are many legislative proposals and discussions around the world right now, in Europe, in the US, in other parts of the world, that maybe for the first time ever will have an effect on our abilities to make policies. And there are any discussions, and I, I don't judge on them on being good or bad. I don't say that that is a stupid idea. But I know that some of them can actually ha hurt the interconnectivity of internet as itself. And I think that we need to continue to work together. What I heard from this lot this week has been very interesting, and my team has been stopping me for going in or having opinions about technical stuff, which I don't know about. That is otherwise what I love to do. But to continue this work together, and hopefully me being here and you coming to us and we can work on issue based together, we can make sure that what I'm here for, and what I know that many of you are there for, is to make sure that internet stays open and interconnected. We do our part. I would love to continue to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yara, now you can uh, take back to your community and I can the virtues that you've actually experienced of having a plenary in the evening rather than in the morning. <laughs> First hand experience. So uh, moving on to highlight a few issues of interest to the ITF community at large. Today I'm gonna to cover uh, some statistics about participation at this meeting, a new event that we had on Sunday, Hot RFC. A little bit about the side meetings and code lounge experiments that we have continued to run here at IETF 101. An update on the IETF Administrative Support Activity 2.0, IASA 2.0, and uh, just a note about respectful behavior in the community. So first, uh, participant statistics. At this meeting, we have 1,189 people on site, uh, and we have 218 attendees for whom it's their first meeting. So uh, thank you to all of you for coming for the first time to experience uh, an IETF in person, and thank you to all of those who've uh, been coming for a long time, who've helped those newcomers uh, find their way. If we compare to uh, meetings, uh, the, our most recent spring meeting, which was last spring, 
we have uh, uh, more people who showed up here than did in Chicago at IETF 98. If we compare to our most recent European meeting, which was last summer, uh, we had more people show up in Prague than, than we did here. Um, you can see the country breakdown on the slide. Um, we had the, the largest traction um, from the US, followed by the UK, uh, China, Germany, Japan, and, um, and you can see the rest, a fairly uh, typical uh, uh, split for us. Folks from 59 countries have showed up at this meeting. Again, that's kind of somewhere in between uh, the statistics for ITF 98 and ITF 99 last year. Uh, just a word about the hackathon. Uh, participation in the ITF hackathon continues to grow meeting over meeting. So this was our largest one yet. We had about 220 people participating on site and uh, 20 remote. We had 35 projects, which is substantially more projects than we've had at, at any prior hackathon. And new for this meeting as well, on Monday night, for those of, those of you who caught it, we had a hack demo happy hour so that all the teams could uh, have a little bit more time to present the results of their work to the community and to um, engage in discussions with, with people who are interested in their projects to understand what they got done over the weekend and how it fits into the rest of the work of the IETF. And we're gonna continue to experiment with that sort of thing. So if you have um, feedback about that event um, or about the hackathon itself, you can always um, email it to the hackathon list. Um, you can email me, you can email Charles Eckel, um, who's, who's uh, been the main driver behind the, the hackathon. And for planning purposes, we are certainly planning to do the hackathon again at IETF 102, July 14 and 15, the Saturday and Sunday uh, at the start of the meeting week. At this meeting, we also tried a new event on Sunday night, uh, organized by Aaron Falk with support on the IESG from Aliyah Atlas and Spencer Dawkins. It's called Request for Conversation, uh, otherwise known as Hot RFC. So this was an opportunity for people who wanted to give brief lightning talks to encourage brainstorming, to find collaborators, to advertise their, um, their bar boffs, or to just generally raise awareness about some new idea that they have or that, they, that they've been working on. Uh, and by all accounts, it seems the feedback that we've gotten so far is, is quite positive. We had 17 lightning talks that were given, and we had about somewhere between 80 and 100 people in the room. It ran concurrently with the second hour of the welcome reception. And you can find the proceedings uh, online. Uh, all the slides are up there. Um, the ISG is very interested in hearing from the community about what they thought about this, whether we should do it again, what we should change or do differently. Um, so please send that feedback to IESG at IETF.org or I'm uh, happy to talk about it at the open mic session here um, as well. And, and big thanks to Aaron for uh, all his work in, in helping to organize that. We've also continued our experiment at this meeting with uh, side meetings and, and the code lounge. So uh, what we've done for side meetings is we've allocated uh, one large room and one small room that people can book in advance for their side meetings. So no more going through your area director to book those slots um, as long as they are um, not conflicting with, with the meal times. Um, both of the rooms have projectors and then if you do want to book a, a meal time slot, signups for those open up um, uh, on site. And just a reminder for people who are thinking about using that uh, again in the future, that we do have the IETF meeting rooms policy which specifies which kinds of meeting, meetings can be held um, as side meetings and which ones are considered corporate meetings that require a payment um, and uh, so it's important to remember the, the line between those things. The code lounge is a portion of ITF meeting room space which has been set aside for people to get together and, and um, hack together to continue their activities from the hackathon or just generally do some development work um, on the side of the ITF meeting. And both of these are still kind of in the experimental stage so we're uh, continuing to collect feedback about um, whether people find them useful and, and refinements that we can make. We've, we changed up the side meeting sign up a little bit so that anybody could sign up this time. Um, definitely interested in your feedback about these experiments. Now to the IETF Administrative Support Activity or IASA 2.0. So um, IASA is the name that we use to describe the way that we structure the administration of the IETF. That means the meeting planning, the financial planning, the fundraising and so on. Uh, IASA 2.0 is an activity that started in November of 2016 um, with a, a sort of project plan that um, Yari Arko, the previous IETF chair, mailed out to the IETF list. Over the last year, we've had a kind of extensive discussion on the IASA 2.0 list and at the IETF meetings uh, about 
restructuring or refactoring the way that we conduct our administrative activities. There's a bunch of different factors that have led to the current structure being um, uh, not the best fit as it was in the beginning. And so we've had this conversation about transitioning to a different structure or whether there's things that we can do to improve upon the current situation. Over the last two meeting cycles, uh, the group has been considering multiple different legal options for what a new structure could look like. Everything from staying exactly as we are, which is as an activity of ISOC where the ITF um, does not have its own uh, legal entity, all the way to becoming an independent organization um, from ISOC to house the administration of the IETF. And yesterday we had a BOF session uh, where we talked in even greater detail about um, several of these different options that have been considered um, and that about which we had sought legal advice. And what happened in the BOF room is a couple of things. First, um, at, by, by the end of the session we had um, rough consensus in the room in favor of creating a limited liability corporation that would be treated as a division of ISOC for tax purposes uh, in order to house just the administrative piece of the IETF. So this doesn't really have anything to do with the standards process and um, everything that the IHG and the IAB do, and that happens in the working groups and among document authors, but just for the administration of the IETF. And this particular legal structure has a number of, of um, uh, values and properties to recommend it, as do several of the others that we considered, but that was kind of where the, the room landed. And if you want more details on any of this, it's all available on the IASA uh, 2.0 mailing list. We also, in that session, got lots of good feedback about many of the organizational details that we would need to hammer out if we went down um, this path of changing the administrative structure. So the plan going forward is, um, first of all, to confirm the hums on the list uh, from, from that session, which is uh, the mail has already gone out about that. Uh, and then to basically take the choice of legal structure, assuming it gets confirmed, and embed that choice in a working group charter, which has also been circulated on the list, um, and via that mechanism confirm the, the sense of the IETF community that this is the direction in which we want to take our um, legal structure for our administration going forward. The charter for the working group would be to update our existing RFCs that describe all of, all of these administrative structures. Um, and then outside the working group, we would begin working on the actual legal documentation, which we would not write in the working group, um, since that's not an appropriate venue to do that kind of thing. Um, and these processes would work in parallel. Um, so if you're interested in any of this, please join the mailing list, IASA 2.0. Um, I know that many people are not interested in this, but um, for some people, it's, an, it's the choice of administrative structure embodies a lot about um, the IETF and, and how we operate as a community. And so I really wanted to just take a few minutes of your time to raise awareness about this in case it's something that people haven't been following. I also wanted to just take a moment to touch on uh, respectful behavior in our community. So on the slide, you can see we have um, a, a list of our existing policies that govern behavior in the IETF. Um, we have guidelines for conduct, which is encoded in a PCP. We have an anti-harassment policy um, put forth by the ISG a couple of years ago. We also have anti-harassment procedures, which created um, our ombuds team is here on site. And the newest policy of these is the IETF meeting photography policy um, that, we, that the ISG put forth just before the meeting um, after consultation with the community and which has uh, been supported by, as you can see, some folks wearing red lanyards at this meeting. Uh, with their choice to not be photographed as an individual when not operating in a leadership capacity, and white lanyards for, for the rest of the crowd. So you can take a minute and you can kind of peruse the policies, familiarize yourself with them if you haven't before. But perhaps more important than reading the policies, I think it's uh, important for everybody to think just for a minute about what happens in this community and how much it is derived from the individual choices that we all make. So this community is really made up of um, it, it is what we make it. And if you want to be treated respectfully, then you need to treat other people respectfully. And I think sometimes that gets a little bit lost, like it's really easy to get really amped up about whatever technical topic you're discussing, or if you happen to be discussing, say, one of these policies on a mailing list, um, it's easy to get lost in the details um, and get overheated about those things. And I think it's important for all of us to kind of take a check sometimes and, um, and think about are we conducting ourselves in the, in the best manner possible to achieve the goals of the IETF? So I wanted to take a moment to do that today, and um, hopefully that's been helpful. We have a whole bunch of other topics that are covered online. 
um, in the report that we sent out to the community at the end of last week. Um, so other experiments that we're running, uh, information about appeals, which we haven't had any of in the last cycle, uh, status update about um, how we're trying to handle some DMARC issues with IETF mailing lists, and lots of other reports from um, other parts of the IETF that you can find online, in addition to the blog um, where we're regularly providing um, narrative content about what's going on in the IETF. And with that, I will turn it over to Administrative Hot Topics. So, Beyonce, if you're coming, come up to the, to the mic, and Portia, Lynn Stanley. So uh, just to explain why the name Beyonce is on the slide. <laughs> so the, the IAOC, which is the, admin, the uh, Administrative Oversight Committee of the IETF, doesn't elect its chair um, in the IETF week until Tuesday morning. So yesterday morning was when we elected the new chair of the IAOC. And yet the slides for this presentation um, need to be built, you know, eons in advance in order to make sure that they're all correct and that the full IOC has the opportunity to review them and, and get every detail right. And so um, in, the, in the initial versions of the slides that you're about to see, uh, the IOC chair was listed as Beyonce because we didn't know who it could be. And, and the thought of it actually being Beyonce was pretty exciting for some of us. So we thought, <laughs> um, you know, why not put that in there? And um, then after we did the election and our new chair, Andrew Sullivan, um, was, was elected, uh, I dared him to leave it in on his part of the slides, <laughs> and he said yes, and so I left it in on my part of the slides as well. So, <laughs> over to you, Portia. Alyssa is going to learn not to dare me to do things. <laughs> um, thanks, Alyssa. I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that I was not trying to be Beyonce. <laughs> Okay, so I'm here to um, thank our host again, and uh, Google and Icon, our co-hosts, we really thank you for everything that you've done um, to help put on 101. There's no way that we could have done all of this work without you, and we appreciate everything that you've done for us this week. The slot has all of our sponsors, and of course, um, we really appreciate your work. BT, British Telecom, is our connectivity um, sponsor. Facebook I, uh, is, oops, go back. Facebook and Oracle are silver sponsors for us. And Google, Icon, and the Hilton uh, Metropole are um, the sources for our welcome reception. So thank you. And of course, in the background, there's so many people who are working to, uh, who come into the, um, into the venue so early to make sure that everything is going um, as it should, and also just working behind the scenes. We've got our code sprint um, and IETF data tracker enhancement, our volunteers for that. And for some reason, the, the slides are going faster than I am. And, um, Next for the hackathon, thank you so much to Cisco and um, DevNet. We appreciate everything that you've done for us. We've had the biggest hackathon um, that we've um, had to date, so thank you.
And of course, there's uh, the knock, the knock, the um, great knock. So volunteers there, we've got line speed, and thank you, Rick Alf, um, Alfin, for you and your team, and Meet Echo, who brings in um, remote participants um, for the meeting. A reminder that Thursday is tomorrow. Uh, we've got Dave Conrad for Thursday Tech Talk. And uh, hopefully everyone will have a chance, or uh, most of you will have a chance to stop by and for that. And last but not least, certainly, we would like to announce our um, global host for Montreal, uh, 10, IETF 105, July 20th through 26, 2019. And thank you very much, Comcast, NBC Universal. So the, the problem is that I can't dance. <laughs> and I only sing old standards. Uh, before I, uh, before I, that's right. Before I begin, um, uh, before I begin talking about uh, the IOC more generally, I, I first want to start uh, with some infinite thanks to, um, uh, to two people who are leaving the IOC, uh, Leslie and uh, Tobias uh, are both previous chairs of, uh, of the IOC. Um, you may not know this, but not everybody in this room is always entirely nice to the IOC. And, and, and these are the people who, um, who took many of those slings and arrows, arrows over time. And, and I understand something about uh, how you can, you know, sometimes you misjudge things. Sometimes the community is not perfectly clear about all of the things that it wants. And I think that both Leslie and Tobias did uh, some wonderful work. They helped us over time. So I really want to thank them very much. I know we're going to thank people later, but anyway. I want to do that mostly because sometimes I was the sling holder. Um, uh, so Glenn and I are joining the, um, the IOC uh, again. I, for my sins, am coming back. Uh, and uh, so my colleagues picked me as the uh, fool who put his head in the sling. So here I am. Um, we have some other uh, welcome uh, to make. Uh, we have a new uh, legal counsel. Uh, and this has been split up a little bit. So uh, Brad is actually here uh, and will be coming up a little bit later so you can see him in the flesh, but there is a picture. Uh, David Wilson is, alas, not here, but uh, he is also uh, part of our new council team, so that's great news. Uh, we also have a new sponsorship fundraiser. Uh, Ken is also here, uh, and um, you know, keep your eyes peeled for him and get your wallets ready. Uh, now, we put up the detailed report already, so I'm not going to go into all kinds of details here, but it's there on the, um, on the slides, and of course, you can find it on the web. Uh, but I do want to remind people of a couple of things. First of all, um, we have this new venue selection committee. Uh, so uh, the meetings committee uh, um, what is, is coming to an end, and the new venue selection committee has been announced. Uh, the IOC appointed Glenn Dean, who is a member of the IOC, uh, to, uh, to chair the new venue selection committee. We're still looking for community volunteers for all of the uh, committees, but I want to take this moment to thank uh, Ole and Avery for their leadership of the meetings committee in the past. Now, why am I standing up here? Well, because of budgets. That's the reason we have the IOC. We're the you know people who um, are nominally responsible to you uh, in order, uh, you know, having to do with anything to do with the money here. And uh, the, the news is not as good as we would like. Um, so we put up the expenses and the annual, uh, the, the budget and also the budget narrative. Uh, that was announced uh, a little while ago and it's on the list. Uh, I urge you to read it. Uh, this is how we, uh, how we are accountable to you. Uh, you know, we do accounting. So um, this is uh, this is something that I really urge you to have a look at because after all, you paid to be here, or most of you did anyway. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the budget is not going down, it's the same, but, but what's really happening is our expenses are static and our revenue is not, it, it's falling. 
Um, in particular, we got a problem with meetings. So, so we're having a, a hard time predicting what the attendance is going to be, and we don't know why. It would be great if we knew why, then we would have a model and it'd be fine, but actually our model's broken. Um, our sponsorship, however, appears to be stable. Other challenges there, as there always have been, um, that's the reason, of course, that Ken has joined us. Um, but, uh, you know, that part seems to be pretty good, but I'm, I'm quite worried about the attendance. So we're going to have to do some things about this. Now, what's been happening in the past is every time we run into a shortfall, ISOC says, well, don't worry about it, we're going to look after that. But that can't go on forever, right? Um, so we're... This, this year, what we're going to do is we're going to take last year's actual contribution and we just increase the budget by that much, uh, the budgeted ISOG contribution, which means that we better come in, inside our, our targets, right? Uh, so that's one thing. Um, we're planning to keep the meeting registration fees uh, the same in 2018. There's no current plan to raise them this year, but I want to draw your attention to that third bullet. The current forecast is that we're going to raise the meeting fees next year. And the guidance that's currently in the system is that we're going to do it a little more than 10% and then 3% you know, in, in, in the following years. Now, we have not voted on this, so we have not, in fact, decided this. But it's early in the year, and we want to warn you now that this is coming so that you can start budgeting in your own budgets for it so that when it happens next year, it's not a giant surprise. Um, so be aware of this um, is potentially coming up. We will be debating this. We'll be discussing it in the IOC. We have a, a retreat in April, and there will be, you know, blood on the ground and everything by the time we leave um, because of the um, uh, discussions over raising rates. Nobody likes to raise rates, but it's uh, it's a fact of life. Uh, at the same time, we know that IASA 2.0 is coming along. We don't know how that's going to affect IETF finances. There's lots of things that could happen there, and nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, that could affect registration fees as well. So you need to be prepared for that. There is the budget and finance page. Uh, I urge you once again to have a look at that budget because that's how we're held accountable to you. Um, so a quick snapshot of the uh, numbers so far. Uh, we've got paid attendance of about 1,200, which is just 40 fewer than projected. So this meeting is looking better than um, the last uh, couple. Uh, we have 418 remote participants registered, however, and that um, that is changing. Uh, you know, fairly rapidly, which has some implications for our budget as well, because we have to support all of that. Uh, there were 213 letters issued, uh, visa letters. Um, so we've got some registration revenues and sponsorship revenues there. I don't think any of this is final. Usually this, um, there, there's some, you know, final adjustment that happens, but um, these are pretty close. Uh, so, you know, these are the numbers right now. Uh, so thanks very much for this. There are some additional materials uh, at the end of this slide deck that you can download online if you want, but I'll stop talking so that we can get on to the interesting things in this meeting. Thanks very much. So next we have the IRTF update. So Allison, if you could come on up. Hello, uh, I think people know who I am and I want people to know more about what the IRTF is as well, but I'm Alison Minkin. Um, this is, uh, you've seen this mission statement before um, in others of these plenaries, but we have a parallel organization of research groups that do uh, work that's forward out ahead of what is reasonable to standardize. Um, and the goal is to strongly have a, a close tie between them to make this a great, a great place for new and innovative thinkers to bring work that can then become applied. Um, we, uh, I've added a no standardization sentence here because we continue to have confusion about whether if we're producing RFCs, they'll also be standards. So um, the, the uh, documents from IRTF, even if they, if they are RFCs and they aren't always going to be, will be experimental or informational and will be, and are clearly labeled as such. And we're working on that within the context of the um, of the uh, stream owners in the um, in the uh, 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 with with Heather on that. Um, this is a list of all the research groups, and I just want to mention that um, they are continuing to meet 
uh, avidly here. And so I think there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of um, bringing together of people who, who are researchers with people who have been more traditionally not researchers. Um, and we have a, a method of something called proposed research groups where you can meet quite freely if you have a good uh, idea for three meetings and then we'll, be, we'll decide if it's actually progressing and is going to be useful. So we have two of those at the moment, Path Aware Networking and the um, uh, Decentralized Internet Infrastructure uh, group that are, um, are uh, moving along in that process. Um, and in fact, uh, Path Aware had its third meeting yesterday and uh, the room was strongly in support of it moving forward and I think that will happen. Um, another bit of news tonight, the technical plenary is partly brought to you by the IRTF uh, because it's, it's co-organized by the, the IAB's uh, committee and by the GAIA uh, Global Access to the Internet for All um, research group. Um, we encourage the groups to meet not only at IETF but also to meet where the researchers are and to import people from, from the protocol community to the more abstract or theoretical groups. And, and MRG has been doing this for years, so they're the only one that's actually not meeting here because they'll be meeting uh, at a conference in, in, in Taipei. Um, and then we've started initial discussion because of some wonderful advocates for it for a quantum internet research group. And uh, the room there, uh, we didn't actually take a hum. Um, I, I don't know what a quantum hum would be like, but we did actually ask about, um, we got some comments about the fact that this might actually be timely now. There's a lot of likelihood that protocols will be developed to manage this really cool low layer that can do quantum entanglement. And those protocols could be developed by not us if we don't take action. So keep your eye on that. Join this mailing list, which is currently called QIRG, Q-I-R-G, um, and uh, see that's very interesting. Um, and also, eventually, we I've said, made this joke so many times, probably people have already heard it from me somewhere, but you'll eventually have to call yourselves the classic IETF, and we'll also have the quantum IETF classical IETF. Um, I've also uh, want to mention that we have a, a yearly workshop which intends to slightly formalize how we do research being brought together with, with protocols. Um, and uh, the submission date is, is uh, April 20th, so it's, it's still in time for you to do your submission. You can either submit a paper that was published in the last year or a short new paper that would be sort of like a lightning talk. Um, and it will take place in Montreal uh, at the next meeting. What we will do, and this is another experiment, is have the meeting during uh, the ITF week. So it'll be on the Monday rather than co-located, but not during the time. This is intended to help people to attend the workshop. Um, we're still, I need to have a conversation with Beyonce about the way that, and, and team about the way that we're going to handle the registration fees. But, um, but, the goal is, again, to bring the people together, and we'd like for people to stay and go to RGs and working groups now that they're so people who've never come. We have quite a few people who are new attendees who are here because of the IRTF and then learned something about uh, many of the speakers were, were new attendees. I should probably start tracking that. Um, and the other thing we'll do is we'll have topical blocks so that so no research groups will meet that day, but also we'll make it so that it'll be easier for the IETF areas to say, ah, most of the routing things are there, so I'll try not to schedule routing things. We're, uh, and I'll have to um, hope that this doesn't blow the minds of our very wonderful secretariat as we try to work on this, but, um, but I've been active in the scheduling anyway. Um, so there's another, another note on the relationships we have, um, and there should be a good song for this, but anyway, we have, uh, we have many times when I, I say, well, I wish that people from such and such research group had been here because look at this great stuff that is being presented, which is from the measurement world or something like that. Um, so I want to advertise that yesterday, for example, the MAPRG had great new data and analysis about, about current research uh, working group topics, IPv6, the HTTP2 push, um, quick DNSSEC, you get the idea. So corner me or send me mail, send mail to the IRSG about uh, what you think might be useful in, way, in ways that we can help with the interworking here. Um, we have uh, another feature, which is a uh, every year we pick two best papers at the Applied Networking Research Prize, ANRP, for each IETF and announce them just before the IETF. Um, we had 
uh, uh, presentations today during the IRTF open group, um, and um, I'll, I'll mention them. These are sponsored by Comcast, NBC Universal, and Internet Society, and I'm very, we're very grateful for that. The sponsorship has been in, increased this year, and we're looking forward to adding some ability to give more people ch chances to come back after they've done one of these presentations and continue their engagement. Um, we had the biggest set of submissions ever this year, and, and as a result, we could have actually had 10 or 12 of these awards, but we don't really have enough time to have presentations. And, and finally, IRTF.org is where you can find all of our info, but if you also go to our, our Twitter feed in Ritafo, you can see the uh, victorious picture of the two ANRP folks that I just posted today um, and uh, find out more. And I'm very happy to, to uh, talk with people or, or answer questions during the open mics. Okay, next we're gonna hear from the uh, past and current NOMCOM chairs. So Peter Yi and Scott Mansfield, if you guys could come on up. Alrighty. This is the NOMCOM report. So for the NOMCOM 2017-2018, I'd like to draw your attention once again to our voting members list and for the list of non-voting members as well. Um, those are the liaisons, advisors, and chair positions. And this is the output of why there is a NOMCOM. <laughs> we made selections for the IAB, IAOC, and IESG as you can see there. Yeah, I didn't get the memo about Beyonce. <laughs> As part of the, nom the NOMCOM's work, um, we also bring up some areas of weaknesses. These are things that we notice while we're doing, uh, going through the NOMCOM process, uh, and this is not new. Um, we brought up these issues last year as well. Um, it still remains, um, these still remain areas of concern. Um, so some areas have very small leadership pools and perhaps even smaller pipelines of future leaders. Um, the internet area, transport area, we just find it difficult to get uh, nominees there. And we would very much encourage anyone who's got the slightest interest uh, in a leadership position to consider running. Um, there's also the obvious uh, concern about employer support um, and so we are giving some consideration, Scott may address that, uh, about an earlier call for nominees um, to give people more time to line up employer support because it takes a while, we understand that, and sometimes if you don't get into the process early enough, um, it's hard to get feedback as well and, and really be engaged in the, the NOMCOM. So our requests of the community. Um, Check your eligibility to volunteer for the NOMCOM. I think last year we had about 125 people. Uh, you can check online um, and you can actually volunteer for the NOMCOM just by putting a, uh, checking the, the yes box on the uh, registration form. And I think it looks back a year, so I know that we surprised some people last year when we uh, announced the uh, selections for the NOMCOM and some folks couldn't remember having actually volunteered. So we will work on that. Um, also, if you're interested in providing feedback on the nominees, uh, you need a data tracker profile, so make sure you have one of those. And then uh, if you have any specific inputs that you'd like to make that are not necessarily about the, uh, the actual nominees, but about the area and issues and things like that, um, do let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Scott, you're up. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'll just introduce myself real quick. I don't want to take a lot of time. I'm Scott Mansfield. I, uh, of course, an individual uh, representing the IETF community, but uh, my uh, employer is Erickson. And so I just wanted to uh, give you a chance to see who I was. And if you have questions about NOMCOM, please come and ask me. 
I would really like to start the process a little bit earlier this year so that we can get some more feedback and try to get a much bigger pool. I would also like to see more people volunteer to be selected to work on the NOMCOM because it really is a great roller coaster ride. You'll have a great time and we actually even feed you a little bit at, uh, at, at the meeting. So that's about, does, does Spencer have a question? <laughs> or uh, Spencer Dawkins, um, third term area director for transport. Um, and I was, I was just going to suggest to the community that uh, we also remember, you know, thank you all for serving and thank you, the NOMCOMs for uh, serve, serving up a pretty impressive group of leadership over a bunch of years, uh, which I've had the opportunity to serve under and serve with. Um, it seems to me that at least a little bit of what we're talking about here is kind of like the Kobayashi Maru uh, thing, where it's like basically this is a fascinating problem to solve about how we how we recruit leadership for a couple of the areas, and that there may not be any way to solve that other than doing the James T. Kirk thing of saying we're going to reprogram the simulator, um, and and that's not your problem to solve, okay. And that's not the ISG's problem to solve or the IEB's problem to solve particularly. That's really a community thing. So I would ask the people in the community be thinking about what, what we as a community can do to reprogram the simulator so that we're not sitting here in 2028 uh, having the same conversation about in the end area and the transport area. Because I'm almost sure there will still be an IP protocol and perhaps even quicker TCP. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I think that that is excellent input in what the NOMCOM can do is continue to bring that that uh, message back to to the leadership and help foster the discussion. Because like like we always say with these NOMCOMs, it's, it's basically you get a big box, you put it in the middle of the room, you let the cats jump in it, and then you close the lid. So the uh, last thing I'll say is I'd like to thank... Um, Kathy Brown for selecting me, and then Peter and Lucy, I'm going to rely on them heavily to hopefully that this, this NOMCOM for 2018-2019 will run as smoothly as the last two. Thank you very much. So just a real quick thanks. I wanted to thank everybody who did volunteer for the NOMCOM 2017-2018. Uh, look for Scott's email shortly um, asking for volunteers. So if you haven't volunteered previously on a registration form, you can do that by email as well. I'd like to thank um, all of those who were nominated and accepted their nominations. Obviously, as we've said, we need more of you. Uh, a special thank you to the Secretariat who makes it so easy for us to have NOMCOM meetings, um, NOMCOM sessions here at the meetings. Um, it really makes a difference. And then finally to the tools team for some quick hacks to the uh, data tracker. We use the data tracker all the time. All of the data goes in there and they made our lives a lot easier. So thank you everyone. I just want to um, second that appreciation for the NOMCOM for, um, for Peter and everyone else who was on the NOMCOM last year. Uh, it's, it's an arduous task, um, particularly in the, in the November meeting uh, and the fall and winter time frame, um, and those who volunteer, I think, um, deserve uh, special recognition from us for their willingness to commit the time and energy that it takes to um, help us uh, find the next generation of leaders for the IETF. So big thanks to um, all of you and to Scott for being willing to um, shepherd it this year. So next, we're going to hear about the Postel Award. Uh, I'm Kathy Brown, and it is that time of year again that it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce and uh, the, t the Postel Award. To those who don't know, um, John Postel was uh, in, in the center of the, the internet. You can see by the uh, relationships, almost everything some of us, all of us are doing, he was there at the beginning. Um, he is um, 
his memory is kept alive in this award, it's kept alive in all of you as well. Um, but the year after his untimely death, the Internet Society established uh, the Jonathan D. Postel Award uh, to honor individuals or organizations that, like John Postel, have made outstanding contributions in service to the data communications community. Um, the list of awardees is quite impressive at this point. Um, there are uh, some, uh, I think, some fabulous recognition here on this uh, list of people. I know in the last four years that I've had the privilege to be involved, uh, this community has nominated and then selected some uh, incredible uh, contributors, and I have noted that the um, delight, <laughs> the delight of those who win is uh, quite um, uh, authentic, real, and they feel quite privileged to have received it. So I'm asking you to think about the nominations for this year. Um, here are the criteria for the award. Uh, for those who might ask, the leadership Award committee is actually the, um, the past recipients. Um, they appreciate a good list, uh, and that list mostly comes from you all. Uh, there is a uh, obviously a a crystal trophy and and a dollar award, but it is really the honor of receiving it. The nominations open today. They will close May the second, and you can do your nominations at this. So um, next we're going to hear a preview of IETF 102. I can invite Chris Bowers to come on up. So uh, on behalf of Juniper Networks, I'm happy to be able to invite you to IETF 102 in Montreal, Canada, coming up this July. And we're looking forward to uh, another very productive meeting. Thanks. Ah, big props for brevity. OK. Um, so next, we are going to recognize uh, a few members of our community. Let's see. And so I'd like to ask um, Deborah Brungard to come on up. Oh, you're already here. Great. Okay, while these two people are currently in the routing area and as chairs, their influence has uh, extended way past uh, the routing area, and I'm sure you all are very familiar with them. The first one is George Swallow. Um, we want to thank him for all his contributions and best wishes for his retirement. He has been chair of the MPLS Working Group for more than 20 years. I think it's going on 21 plus now. He authored more than 40 RFCs. He authored the first RFC on RSVP traffic engineering, and also many have pointed to me that his LSP ping has also been one of the most famous of his accomplishments. And yes, as they say, yes, we still got it up. Um, and he's mentored many IET efforts um, throughout his uh, time with us, including myself. So George, would you like to stand up and give you a hand?
Okay, and the next person is a very familiar face to you all also. It's Pat Thaler. She has been IETF's IEEE go-to person for everything. And uh, she's been um, uh, IEEE 802 participant since 1985. Um, she has, I've heard, held the most leadership positions in IEEE of any person. So last week or the week before, they really honored her there, and we are honoring her here. Um, her first IETF attended, we estimated IETF 50, and she most instrumentally helped us form our IETF IEEE 802 Committee Coordination Group, which has really helped our relationships. And currently, she's the DebtNet Working Group Chair. Pat, stand up. Hey, thank you. So, thank you to both of you. Thank you. Uh, so next we're gonna recognize our outgoing IESG members. So we have three people rotating off uh, this year. First, Aaliyah Atlas um, from the routing area. Uh, Aaliyah has been a persistent voice on the IESG, at least in, in my experience, um, keeping us honest as far as um, uh, the way that we operate the way that we try to shepherd work and steer the community in order to make sure that uh, our process is open to as wide a variety of um, voices and interests and individuals as possible. Um, and I think that has uh, made a, a lasting impact on the IESG and the work that we do in the IETF. Um, she's also really focused a lot on the leadership aspect, um, particularly in the routing area um, uh, thinking about, you know, training new leaders and um, how we can help people be successful in the IETF. And I think um, in addition to all of her um, many technical contributions, we, um, we owe her a, a debt of gratitude for, for those efforts, which, um, you know, for the rest of the community, maybe not what weren't visible outside of the routing area or the IESG, but I think we're, we're quite important. Um, we have uh, some gifts that we got for our IESG members here. Um, <clears throat> Actually, there's three of them, and we had to kind of decide, do we want to get all of them ponies, or do we want to get all of them unicorns? We ended up getting two ponies and a unicorn, so um, Aaliyah, we have, a, we have a pony for you up here. Come on up. Uh, it's actually a pony in a beer mug. Uh, <laughs> one of one of the groups that Aaliyah has uh, shepherded at length. So uh, next we have Benoit Clays. He's been uh, that one of the ops and management ADs. Um, so on Sunday, I think it was the Sunday IESG meeting this week, uh, Benoit put his hand up to speak on some topic. I don't even I don't even remember the exact agenda item that we had in the IESG's uh, own Sunday morning meeting. And on Jabber, one of the other area directors uh, immediately wrote to me and said, uh, "What do you want to bet he mentions Yang?" <laughs> and the crazy thing is, he didn't. It was crazy. It was like 30 seconds of speaking, and he did not mention Yang. Um, <laughs> in addition to his many efforts to, uh, uh, to push Yang throughout the industry and in the IETF, uh, Benoit has been relentless in um, holding us accountable to being relevant to the industry, uh, to uh, adopting operator feedback and input into the IETF and to uh, trying to make the IETF a, uh, a place where um, that sort of input is uh, welcome and incorporated and um, that the on the ground experience that operators have um, is reflected in the standards that we create. And I think, um, again, that will have a lasting impact, not just in the, in the ops area, but, um, but throughout the IETF and, and certainly um, in the IESG. So 
Um, Benoit, your pony comes in a Yang mug, so if you could come on up, uh, we'll give that to you. Actually, it says forever Yang, so. <laughs> Uh, and finally, we have um, Kathleen Moriarty, who's, who will be rotating off as well from the security area. Um, Kathleen has uh, been a stalwart um, colleague of mine, personally, I would say. Um, uh, we joined around the same time. Um, has really brought a, a, a view from the operational security community um, into the IETF itself. Um, and onto the ISG that I think uh, didn't really exist uh, uh, in, its, in its current form before. Um, and that has, I think, enlightened all of us into many of the aspects that um, were not um, often considered in protocol development um, in the IETF uh, as recently as um, four or five years ago. And so I think uh, she, I hope she will continue to provide that perspective um, in her future endeavors and as an individual participant. Um, and that we will um, continue to carry that work forward uh, as we transition to the new IESG. Now, Kathleen, um, we do, since we, you know, had to go with either ponies or unicorns, we got you a unicorn because, you know, security area. Um, but <laughs> uh, uh, it's actually a pretty special unicorn because it's musical when you squeeze it. So, um, yeah, Alexa just showed this to me. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, if you can find a way to use this as an, as an individual participant going forward, like bring it up to the microphone with you, I mean, there's all kinds of things that could be done with a musical unicorn, let's be honest. So, um, come on up. Additionally, we couldn't figure out what, what to put in your mug, so we didn't get you a mug, but we did get you the uh, required security <laughs> hoodie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it falls to me to notify the community when two members of the IAB have escaped. In this, <laughs> this particular year, the escapees are Lee Howard and Joe Hildebrand. If, I think these guys like each other, so if they would come up together, I'll embarrass them at the same time. <clears throat> First, uh, I want to call out uh, Lee's service to the IAB because he did something that's really important. Is He was a champion for a particular evolution of the internet uh, becoming the default. So um, we have seen Lee, in almost any context, challenge us to make sure that whatever we were thinking about, whatever we were building, uh, not only worked on IPv6, that it was IPv6 native in every possible way. And so as a champion of IPv6, he's really helped the, uh, the whole IEB not just focus their attention on that particular issue, but make sure that that context is the base part of how we think about the network going forward. Um, and I really want to thank him for that service. Uh, and for each of them, we've developed an architecture tester so that they can go out into the world and continue to serve the internet. This particular one, which is uh, 
dev device uh, 0002, make sure that the network it's connected to is IPv6 capable, has no NATs on it, and traverses uh, with absolutely no interference. So please take it with you uh, and make sure uh, that uh, you use it well. Um, Joe's service to the IEB uh, started at the same time as mine, and I'm, I'm desperately sorry to lose him as a colleague because uh, he helped me birth so many bad ideas. <laughs> <clears throat> and I even uh, helped him birth one or two. Um, the, the one thing I, I really want us to, to focus on from, from Joe's service, in addition to his tremendous knowledge of both modern development practices and how middle boxes work and how the web works, is his insistence that we think about explicitness in the network. Um, when, we, when we think about how people derive signal from the network, um, we think a great deal about how people watch the network as it passes. And although Brian and many others of the, uh, of the community think about measurement very deeply, Joe was really insistent that we think very hard about what it would take to make explicit signaling a core part of the uh, network architecture. That work is still going on. Um, but uh, we, we think Joe can take it forward in Mozilla and his other roles. And we've built for you this network tester, which looks at very explicitly to see if there's uh, adequate TLS, whether the uh, domain name system is working as it ought to, and whether the, the rest of the things that go into making uh, the web substrate work exactly as they're meant to. If you'd like to play along at home, uh, this is, of course, an open source project. It's Uh, we'd like to thank Yari Arco for leading it. It's at his GitHub repo, um, so github.com slash Yari Arco slash arch tester. It's uh, fully open source. You can add your own tests and change it any way you like. Uh, thank you to both of you for your service to the IED. Would you like to stand and hold those? Uh, <laughs> there's more than one of these yeah. plaques. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's right. You, I'm going to get to pretend you work for Google for a moment. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. So <laughs> it's great that the uh, the ISOC plaques are themselves an open source project because we'll be adjusting this in the back as we go. Uh, our, our next uh, appreciation is for Neville Brownlee. Neville, would you come come up, please? I, I don't see Neville. So, so let me let me tell you a brief story before we appreciate him in his absence. And that is, uh, Neville actually served a year longer than he asked to serve. Uh, he actually tried to retire last year, and Robert Sparks and the rest of the IEB basically. Um, threw our, our collective arms around his knees and said, we're not ready yet, please wait. And he was kind enough uh, to give us an extra year of his time and attention. And uh, this year, he spent a great deal of time with our incoming ISE, Adrian Farrell, uh, to bring uh, him up to speed and to make sure that uh, the uh, RFC editor function had no, no uh, blip um, because of uh, any lack of uh, information being transmitted. And so, although he has probably escaped for a very well-earned pint somewhere, uh, I'd like you to uh, join me in expressing your opinion. We'll catch him sometime later in the week for the obligatory picture with the plaque. Thanks. Um. So that brings us to the technical plenary. So um, Brian, I'll leave it to you and I'm gonna go sit down. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm about to say something that's gonna surprise um, some people in the room, the internet is a network of networks. Not as good as the Beyonce joke, I know, I'm sorry. Um, so the variety and the diversity of networks that people use to connect to the internet is increasing. So part of this is due to innovation access technologies, 
part of it's due to the fact that there's just there are just more internet users in the world and the diversity of sort of the the ways that they can connect to the internet the physical infrastructure um is is expanding and we thought it would be interesting to have a discussion about the future of access networks given this diversity so um i'm going to escape very quickly i'd like to call um jane coffin um the um co-chair of the gaia research group and director of development for the internet society uh, Director of Villain Strategy for the Internet Society to come up and introduce our plenary speakers, if you'd also come up. Good evening, and thank you very much for staying. We have three fabulous speakers. I'm not going to speak very long, but what I am going to do is let you know who is up here with me. We have Leandro Navarro, who's a professor at UPC in Barcelona, but he also works with Guifi.net, which is a community network in Spain. We have Steve Song, who if you haven't seen his many possibilities.net website, take a look. Don't crash it right now. But uh, he has great mapping and is one of a, a fabulous host of humans that I work with on community networks. John Brewer knows a lot about community networks and a lot about what's up in the sky with satellites. So if you give us one sec, we'll get started. I just lost my phone and got it back, so I'm very excited. So how do these people all weave together in this network of networks? So one, on community networks, I have the privilege to work with people every day who are building networks from the bottom up, ground up, community up, we call it for the community, with the community, by the community. It's partnering at the local level to provide connectivity where there isn't connectivity. As many of you know, there's obviously this digital divide around the world. And we see the gaps where people aren't going to provide that connectivity, whether it's wireless, wireline, Wi-Fi, or other. These networks, uh, Leandro will tell you more about them, but they're sparking innovation at the local level. And we're stealthily using major meetings like the IGF. I know that can be a point of contention for some, but we support the IGF for many reasons, but we're using it to bring community networks together so they can meet each other, know each other, and do more work at the technical level. On the mapping of infrastructure side and resources, the Spectrum cocktail, Steve will talk about that. And you'll see some of the stories with respect to infrastructure gaps from his maps. Then we'll move over to John to talk about the future in the sky. Many of you also know that with respect to spectrum and satellites, you need orbital slots, something very important. We don't do that here. The ITU helps out with that, but that's part of hanging the birds in the sky. So that's a network architecture that meets spectrum plus with technical innovation. And the question is, is that really gonna be the future of connectivity? So I think satellites are almost as cool as submarine cables, but that will be up for you to decide. Each of our speakers has 12 minutes, then we'll take Q&A. So, Leandro, you're up first. We couldn't have done any of this without Cindy, so thank you. Hi. Okay, so um, I'm going to start uh, talking about um, the local part of uh, of uh, connectivity. Um, so, so this is about community networks, or in other words, this is about um, uh, about everyone, um, but not everyone in the room, but everyone in the world. Um, and that is not initially technical. It's about um, rights, human rights. So, if you look at Article 19, uh, well before the internet appeared. 
uh, it says that we have the right to seek, receive, and, in, and, um, and exchange information and ideas through any media. And now we are talking about the internet. So um, we, we, we all know not everyone has access to the internet, but even worse, uh, not even everyone can provide it. So this is quite diverse. If we look at this map about the world's population, uh, you see it's quite diverse in density. If we focus on the, like, the part we are, like London and, and that column, we see that um, Europe is, is well populated as it is uh, most part of Africa. But when we move to, uh, let's say, the IP space, uh, Europe is there, it's, it's, it's a hot area. Even the northern part, which is not that populated, it's also well connected, but uh, you don't see Africa there. Um, why? Well, we, we know, and it has to do also with any other type of infrastructure. So when you look at um, electricity or lighting, you see that Europe is bright, as, whereas Africa is, um, is not. So we know there are many obstacles, um, but we are aiming, or um, I think many of us are aiming to uh, what we call it, what people call it the universal service. So it's, it's the right of having a um, functional internet connection that is affordable. Affordable means different things for different locations. Uh, and in the end is, is to, to participate in society. Um, we know how to do it in urban areas, uh, in rich areas. Uh, it's very easy because people is closer to each other, so infrastructure is easy to, easy to deploy. And how about rural areas? I mean, places where people is spread out um, and maybe they have less money to spend. Um, so the, the solution to have sustainable infrastructure, sustainable services, it's, it's a combination of uh, business models, diversity in business models and technology, diversity in technology. Um, so just looking quickly about uh, what is the distribution of offline population, um, that there is a kind of market, a big market in, in Africa by more than about a billion people uh, if you look at Asian Pacific, 2.4 billion. So I think it deserves uh, a lot of attention. Um, also, when you look at, at the gaps, uh, there is, in addition to the geography, there is a gap of gender, there is a gap of uh, income, there is a gap of uh, non being in urban areas, there is a gap of age, there is a gap of education. So there are many gaps. And, um, and well, I mean, it's a challenge, really, to deliver in such a um, diverse environment. Um, again, we know how to do it for the world economy, for the rich countries. Uh, it kind of works in, in some local markets. Uh, definitely is very difficult in, in what they call it subsistence economy, where there's little money, little formal uh, structures, um, and basically survival. Um, so um, how do we offer? How do we provide affordability? Well, um, there is one model we know is uh, we bring the connectivity to them and then, well, they pay if they can. Or the other way is like uh, we, we try to, to help develop those infrastructures uh, locally and, 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 uh, um, and, and bootstrap an economy in a way. Um, so within farms, fields, and, and less profitable places, they found out some time, some time ago that, that that is possible to do to do that, not at market prices, but maybe at um, local provision. And people learn, and there are many examples, people learn how to do it, and they created their own infrastructures. So that's what we call community networks. I mean, uh, networks which are, we, we call it crowdsource, which are built by citizens and by contribution and interconnection sounds like the internet. Um, and then, um, so we end up having a shared um, networking infrastructure, um, and, and that infrastructure is built on anything. Anything that works, that is cheap enough, that it's uh, interoperable enough with the different other components. So you will see community networks are not by far homogeneous. Um, anything is interconnected, and then um, um, governance is quite open. Uh, it's like, uh, you will see some examples later, or one example. Uh, it's open to anyone. Um, it's cooperative. 
sometimes because there is no other way than doing it at cost. There's no margin for, for profit, um, initially at least. Um, who invests? Anyone. Anyone with small investments together uh, make uh, produce results. And, and of course, it's open to anyone. Uh, so openness, in many senses, is critical for the development of these local infrastructures. This is how, for instance, looks like one uh, of these networks in a semi-rural area where, where um, you see a lot of connections, a lot of homes connected through Wi-Fi links. Um, this is part of, uh, of Giphynet, which in a way is a small internet in, in, in this region of the world. Many local networks, many uh, groups, they connect with each other and then they share some internet connection. Uh, all these islands are not, in many cases, are not interconnected among themselves. They just, just belong to a, to a community that have common governance principles. Um, so they, um, they are not uh, like, a, like a restaurant model, uh, we call it. Like, uh, it's not that you have to go to a licensed place to get connectivity. Of course, that is the operator model. But it's more like a homemade, like home-cooked uh, connectivity produced by by volunteers that become sometimes operators, uh, small operators, by based mostly on, on Wi-Fi, nowadays also including Fiverr, and they learn how to organize and grow themselves, and they've created like a, or a, um, an optical uh, backbone. Uh, they share a, a number of uh, internet connections. Um, they are very successful in, in traffic and interconnection with uh, the local exchange. Um, so, and this is only like uh, in, in about 12, 13 years. Um, the governance of many of these community networks, there are hundreds around the world. They are typically based on, on the idea of a commons, of an infrastructure commons, um, similar to uh, fisheries, uh, for, community forests. I mean, it's, a, it's an old model formalized by Elin Rostrom on Nobel Prize of Economy. And, um, and of course, the objective of these uh, initiatives uh, is about um, uh, sustainability, mainly, uh, which is, uh, they call it avoiding the tragedy of the commons. Um, and ensure that everyone has an opportunity to expand the network and use the network. And everyone means uh, not only citizens, but also professionals, uh, small companies, private, public organizations that benefit from that infrastructure in that place. So, um, so you know, if we want to uh, address a problem of the, these diverse uh, needs uh, of the unconnected, uh, there must be multiple business models probably adapted to different local conditions. Uh, we know the large operators, we know the WISPs, we know, for instance, community networks, and then they differ in, in, in many aspects, um, which is good. So you can, we can find the optimal solution. Uh, and also, be, we have to be careful because technologies usually come already with some business models. Think about GSM or 5G, they, they have uh, the operator model behind. But also there are more decentralized technologies like Wi-Fi, Mesh, Bitcoin, all that stuff, which allow uh, these kind of initiatives. And, and of course, all these, uh, uh, all these models are supported by the idea of infrastructure sharing, which makes things more complicated, but less costly. And um, open access networks are useful, internet exchanges are useful, even some community networks become, uh, become that in, in, uh, along the growth. So uh, related to our uh, IETF community, um, community networks are places for experimentation, basically. So you, you find anything. I mean, Giffinet has a lot of uh, autonomous systems. They use BGP, they use OSPF, any kind of uh, routing protocol you can imagine, someone tried. Um, they, they, it's an AP network, so anything, anything works. Um, there are a lot of uh, like uh, expansions towards like creating a regional uh, internet exchange about experimenting with network virtualization, anything. And also in the economic model, uh, because it's based not on a centralized uh, authority, but on, on a compensation system. We call it like we compensate consumption and, and contribution incentives. And now they are exploring for years uh, the idea of blockchain, crypto coins as a way to decentralize uh, that. So. My, my final point is that, yeah, there is a need for an open internet. Without an open internet, uh, these uh, networks would not be possible. Without the idea of self-provision, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, we have to make sure that this is uh, legal, allowed, easy, uh, accessible to everyone. 
um, cooperation is the basis to construct this infrastructure that no, no single one can build. Um, a lot of lessons learned from community networks, not just in bringing in connectivity, but also bringing development, bringing business models, bringing income, bringing jobs, bringing uh, local resilience to the digital infrastructure of many communities. Um, we need standards, we need interoperability, uh, we need commodity components, we need ways to incrementally upgrade the networks, we need to decentralize uh, all the aspects. And my point is that I think that connectivity for the next 50% of the global population will come uh, bottom up. And, and that's a hot topic of the Gaia working group, so you're welcome to come tomorrow to discuss the details. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is, uh, is Steve Song. I work with the Network Startup Resource Center on, uh, on increasing access to wireless spectrum. I'm also a senior fellow uh, with the Mozilla Foundation uh, working on digital access and inclusion. Uh, I'd like to apologize in advance for the uh, title of my slide uh, opening. I don't really know how to connect everyone. Um, but I do have some ideas about how... Um, how we could improve things. Um, the, the guy you see on the right-hand side in that slide, his name's Peter Bloom. He runs a nonprofit organization in Oaxaca in Mexico, and they build out low-cost uh, GSM base stations in remote areas where the larger operators don't go. And, and Peter was at the Mobile World Congress um, a couple of weeks ago. And the Mobile World Congress, in case you don't know, it's a kind of global shindig for mobile network operators, and he came back from it and he said to me, he said, Steve, you know, I get the feeling that people care more about connecting refrigerators to the internet than they do about connecting the poor, and I, and I think this is actually true. I mean, if you look for a conference on the Internet of Things, I mean, you can probably go around the corner. I mean, you can go to one every week for the, for the rest of the year and not run out, whereas trying to find people to talk about connecting uh, those who can't afford the internet or, or, or where the internet doesn't exist. That's a lot thinner on the ground. And, um, and that matters. And, and the reason it matters uh, is because of this. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the internet is a mutant superpower. I mean, it, 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 is there anyone who doesn't feel like the internet is a mutant superpower? I mean, it hasn't been like this profoundly changed by the way the internet sort of enables you to, to learn, to manifest things in the world, to connect with people, it's incredible. And as we were discussing at lunch today, it's not always a good mutant superpower, but it is indeed a superpower you would not want to be without. And the problem then is that for those without access, they're moving backwards only by standing still as the internet becomes a more and more valuable resource. And so by not focusing on connecting the unconnected, we're creating an increasingly large digital divide. And this, this is not okay, at least it's not okay for me. And so um, most of my work is in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, about the sort of technological development of access. And I'm, I'll start here, uh, this was 2005 and The Economist had worked out that mobile phones were actually going to be the big thing in terms of access. And indeed, you know, it, even in 2005, we had no idea just how important mobile phones were going to be in terms of connecting um, the, uh, uh, those without access. And that was before, before you could actually get the, uh, the internet on mobile phones. And there was a general perception, and I think it persists now, that basically the problem solved, right? Mobile phones are just going to sort of eventually connect everyone. But the reality isn't actually like that. Uh, subscriber penetration is now tapering off and the business models for the large operators simply don't 
make it into sparsely populated rural areas. We, we, we actually need something different. And before I talk about that, I want to talk about one other technology that doesn't get talked about as much as, uh, as, as mobile networks or mobile telephones, but I think it's a technology that is having as big an impact in uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, as mobile phones themselves, and that's fiber optic networks. So 10 years ago, there was effectively no fiber optic undersea cables reaching sub-Saharan Africa. Well, technically there was one, but it was controlled by a cartel and it was more expensive than satellites. So we'll just say no. But, um, uh, and, and fast forward to 2018, and there were over a dozen high capacity undersea cables um, uh, reaching sub-Saharan African countries with six more planned in the next couple of years. And for me, this is staggering. I would never have projected this level of investment. And of course, that investment sparked a tsunami of investment in ter terrestrial fiber infrastructure now to the extent that primary and secondary cities across the continent have access to fiber optic infrastructure, which is amazing because once you're on fiber, you are only milliseconds from the living beating heart of the internet. But the challenge then becomes, how do we actually get from those fiber points of presence out to reach everyone? And that, that answer lies in wireless spectrum. And of course, we've all seen headlines like this, you know, the spectrum crunch cometh, the access to spectrum has become a real issue. Um, it's part, it partly a real issue simply because of the pace of technological change, uh, that regulation simply isn't keeping up with technological change. And I'll give an example of this. This was a decision taken in 2006 among African countries to make a transition from analog uh, terrestrial broadcasting to digital terrestrial broadcasting. And it was projected it would take about 10 or 11 years, which is pretty speedy by regulatory standards for the refarming of spectrum. And mostly it hasn't quite kept up with that. It's, it's, it's not done yet. But what is interesting is what 2006 did not know about the future. It didn't know about the smartphone, which was gonna be introduced in the next year. Actually, it did know about Netflix, but the prime means of delivery of Netflix in 2006 was the US Postal Service. And it didn't know about tablets and the confluence of those things, streaming media on tablets. So while this decision was chugging along, technologies just blew right past it in terms of the, the delivery of media. And this is going to happen more and more. We need regulations that can cope with the pace of technological change. And we need access to spectrum. And so as demand has exceeded the administrative availability of spectrum, uh, we needed a model for making spectrum available. And the dominant model uh, is now the spectrum auction, which the economists tell us is the fairest way of making spectrum available because those who value it are willing to pay the most for it. But it becomes problematic, especially in poor countries. Now, these are some spectrum auctions in the, the last four or five years across a number of African countries. And what you can see there is you know, the price pay, paid for, for spectrum is you know, between 25 and $100 million. But that's a su successful bidders for that spectrum were a maximum of one. And that's typically the largest uh, mobile network operator or the incumbent who got access to that spectrum. Or in fact, sometimes it's none because the actual price floor of the spectrum is so high. And what happens when the price floor is that high? A, you don't get the competition that you wanted from, uh, from the auction in terms of multiple winners. But also recent research suggests that very high uh, um, uh, fees paid at auction for spectrum leads to lower quality networks, to reduce build out, and worst of all, to higher prices for consumers. But this is the future we are promised. This is a, a, right now in the UK, um, there's an auction going on for, uh, for 5G spectrum and that mobile networks will, will, will solve all these problems by rolling out everywhere. But in fact, this is not going to lead to increased rollout into um, poor, sparsely populated rural areas because this model doesn't incentivize anyone to do that. And then there's another piece of spectrum a tiny unloved corner of the spectrum band, the ISM bands, and uh, uh, Wi-Fi, which, I mean, I think we all know and love, but the meteoric rise 
of Wi-Fi technology in terms of its pervasiveness and embeddedness in everything is absolutely phenomenal and doesn't get sufficient rec recognition by regulators in terms of its impact. And it's not just Wi-Fi in you know, Heathrow Airport in this hotel. Across the African continent, there has been in the last two to three years a spectacular rollout of uh, Wi-Fi enabled networks. And those models are, some are community led models, some are government led models, some are commercial models, but it happens because the technology is cheap and powerful and because you don't require a license. The barrier to actually rolling, out, uh, rolling it out is very, very low. So you have, you know, and, and the, way I, the way I sort of think about it is, you know, if you've seen the movie Aladdin, you know, in the, and uh, the genie describing himself, you know, phenomenal powers, itty bitty living space, you know, and that's, that's that tiny amount of spectrum that is available for, for Wi-Fi is quite small compared to the rest of the available spectrum. One of the things we could do is simply expand that, those ISM bands a little, especially in five gigahertz, just by expanding those ISM bands, we can increase the amount of innovation that goes on by community networks like GIFINET. But it doesn't stop there because there's a host of new companies out there building incredibly inexpensive power technology, uh, uh, inexpensive low power um, and low cost technologies. And those might be in dynamic spectrum like TV white space technologies. They might be in a new generation of uh, uh, LTE base stations. But you know, what's the point of having a $3,000 LTE base station if you pay $25 million for your spectrum, right? It throws the entire sort of, you know, affordable access business model off. So we need new models. I mean, our current regulatory frameworks for, for, for spectrum are a bit like a 19th century hotel, you know, where Baron Sternberg has his room reserved whether he's traveling or not, you know, and many of the rooms are empty and uh, it's just not an efficient way of, of making things happen. And one thing we know about software is it's very good at resource management. So a more uh, uh, Airbnb style approach to the allocation of spectrum might serve us better. And not just for spectrum that's, that's been unassigned, but even spectrum that's been, uh, been assigned to operators where they aren't using it, perhaps they can get a, a, a rebate on their universal service obligations by allowing other people to, to use that spectrum. So the way I think of it, and I'm trying out a new metaphor, so bear with me, is like a jar filled with these large rocks, you know, and, and that's our current regulatory regime is just we have a jar. We have, we have large rocks and we have the jar, but it doesn't, the jar looks full, uh, full but it's not. It's, it's actually less than 50% of the volume of the jar. And what we need are smaller, we need regulation for smaller operators, whether they're a community, nonprofit, uh, for-profit, um, or municipal to be able to fill in those gaps, whether they're regional geographic gaps or niche sectoral gaps, we, we, we need a new framework that has, you know, as this jar has smaller rocks. And, but the last point I wanna make here is that as we do that, um, it turns out that not only do we need um, regulation for smaller operators, we really need more diversity in the access networks themselves. Uh, because when you get identical business models and identical investment frameworks, as we see across you know, mobile network operators, it's very hard for there to be real competition. What you ultimately get is a kind of race to the bottom in technology uh, or in terms of service. But when we have a diversity of access technologies, whether it's um, unlicensed spectrum, dynamic spectrum, light licensing and licensed approach and other technologies like uh, fiber optic, um, then it's very difficult for the, the competition to become like for like and you get more innovation in service provision. And that leads me actually to our next speaker talking about um, a really exciting uh, area of access diversity, the uh, emerging um, changes in the satellite market. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your time.
All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, John Brewer, as you can hear from my accent, I'm from New Zealand. Um, my uh, my talk is premise that the future is up in the sky. We're going to be talking about satellite. And uh, to talk about the future, we need to understand a bit of language. Uh, so first, we're going to start to talk about why we need satellite. Then I'm uh, going to introduce you to the three main orbits uh, and their latencies uh, of the satellite networks. We're going to talk a lot about radio spectrum. We're going to talk briefly about satellite architectures. And I'm going to take you through three uh, new commercial ventures. So first off, why we need satellite. Uh, this is pretty easy. Uh, this is a chart of the cost and uh, relative cost and complexity of various technologies servicing broadband access uh, with population density along the x-axis. Uh, once you get to 10 or fewer people per square kilometer, satellite is less costly and less complex than any other access method. Uh, I've adapted this chart from a Communications Research Canada chart they submitted to the 80222 Working Group about 15 years ago. It's an amazing chart, though, and it holds true today. So uh, we're going to get into the orbits and latency. Here I've got uh, a scale drawing here of the Earth with the three main orbits we'll talk about, low Earth orbit, LEO, medium Earth orbit, uh, MEO, and GEO, geosynchronous orbit. We've got LEO down there at about 1,000 kilometers above the Earth, give or take a few hundred. We've got MEO at 10,000 Ks, give or take a few thousand. And we've got GEO sitting about 36,000 kilometers above our heads. Um, I've got latencies down there, and these latencies are actually uh, four one-way trips put together because when you're sitting at a computer on a satellite terminal, sending a request up to the satellite, it's going down to an Earth station, it's going out to the internet, fetching your data, coming back to the Earth station, going up to the satellite, down to your terminal. So these are the latencies before you hit the internet. Uh, best case in LEO is going to be about 12 milliseconds. That's imperceptible. Uh, MEO, 120 milliseconds, still pretty much imperceptible. And uh, GEO at 480 milliseconds, yeah, that's going to be perceptible. And so I've got this little curve, this funny bunch of dots there in the middle. And that's actually a, um, a about 40 million um, samples from of human reaction time, uh, where people have sat in front of a computer and they've looked at an image flash up and they've clicked on it. Basically, this shows that uh, about half of all people uh, are going to perceive something as being slow if it's slower than 270 milliseconds. Uh, so very, very, very few people are going to notice a latency of 120 milliseconds everybody is going to notice a latency of 480 milliseconds. That's before you get your web page. So the uh, perception of satellite to date has been, oh, God, it's slow. And uh, yeah, that's going to keep going for a bit with some technologies. Now, I'll introduce you to the spectrum here. Three terms I want you to know in spectrum are C-band, KU-band, and KA-band. I've got a little note down at the bottom uh, about L-band and V-band, which are also uh, satellite technologies, but they're not really used for broadband access. Um, Steve was talking about the small amount of Wi-Fi spectrum. Uh, yeah, I've got that in blue down there at the bottom. And then I've also got the 2G, 3G, 4G bands uh, in orange. Still a very tiny amount of radio spectrum. Um, C-band is, uh, is the smallest of the broadband satellite bands. And it's got a couple of holes in it because of Wi-Fi. But there's still a bit of spectrum there. Uh, C-band, uh, KU-band starts at about 12 gigahertz, goes up to about 18 gigahertz, and uh, there's a bit of interference from microwave linking and other technologies there, but uh, at least in New Zealand, we're starting to shift uh, shift some, some microwave services out of that band and freeing it up for satellite. Uh, KA-band starts at about 26 gigahertz and goes up to 40, and there's not a lot going on there, a little bit of microwave linking a little bit of LMDS, which never went anywhere. So it's pretty clean, pretty empty. Huge amounts of spectrum in KA, uh, quite a bit in KU, uh, not very much in C-band. Uh, quick primer on satellite spectrum. We've got four things that we think about for spectrum. We think about availability, reuse, antenna sizes, and rain fade. And uh, well, C-band, very little spectrum, KA-band, quite a lot. Uh, reuse, which we'll talk about in the next slide, uh, we've got very low reuse in C-band, very high reuse in KA-band. Antenna size, pretty obvious, huge antennas for C-band, tiny antennas for KA-band. And then rain fade, uh, very little rain fade in C, quite a bit in KA-band. I'll quantify that in a few slides. Uh, first off, we've got uh, reusability. 
So reusability is a function of the uh, frequency, the size of the waves, little waves uh, spread less, and also the distance away from Earth. So uh, your low Earth orbit satellites are gonna have better reusability of spectrum than your geo satellites, just because the spot beam has less time to spread. Uh, with C-band spectrum, imagining we're at a geostationary satellite uh, orbit now, 36,000 Ks up, you may get a C-band channel covering about half of Australia. I made this slide for the Osnog uh, meeting, so it's Australia. Um, at KU band, uh, you're going to get about four uh, spots of the same of the same channel. You're going to get to reuse the same channel about four times uh, in the same area as you would a single C band channel. And KA band is 16 to 20 times, uh, so you get a, an amazing amount of reuse uh, from KA band, from KA band. Now about those antenna things, well. Uh, an antenna basically focuses energy, focuses radio energy. It doesn't um, make more energy, but to focus uh, a, a one watt of radio energy uh, in C band, you'd need a 1.2 meter dish. In KU band, to focus the same amount of energy, you'd only need a 600 mil dish. And in KA band, 300 mil dish. We're talking A4 sheet of paper compared to 1.2 meter giant thing that acts as a sail in the wind. So really, uh, KA band, huge amounts of spectrum, uh, very small antennas, huge amounts of reusability. It's like a panacea until you get to the rain. And I could really just leave this slide up here and you just believe me, but um, I made a chart that you can download and look uh, at offline because it's a bit dense. But um, here in the right-hand side y-axis, we've got drizzle, light rain, medium rain, heavy rain, tropical downpours. Uh, and on the uh, left-hand uh, y-axis, we've got attenuation in decibels per kilometer. Um, when you're going from a satellite uh, terminal on the ground to a satellite and you're going straight up, you're going through a couple of Ks of rain. If you're going at an angle, you may be going through a couple of more Ks of rain. Um, having attenuation of a few decibels per kilometer, you quickly lose your link budget and you run out of signal. Um, in a medium rainstorm, C band doesn't notice, KU band doesn't notice, KA band starts to go away. In a heavy rain, um, C band doesn't notice, KU band starts to flicker, you might get a bit of packet loss, KA band just goes away. It really just goes away. And in tropical downpours, which you know happen every afternoon uh, for a couple of minutes in most tropical places, your KA band service is just gone, even with a several meter dish. So. I've got a uh, straw man here for uh, temperate climate, uh, saying, say I've got a 1.2 meter dish on my roof. I like 1.2 meter dishes, they're, they're nice and big. So uh, we might, out of a KA service, get 512 megabits per second off of one of these new satellite uh, services, but only 99.7% reliability. There's a satellite company in the Pacific actually selling 99.7% reliability and talking it up is a big deal and really the people buying it um, don't have any idea that that means they're gonna drop out like every single day. And they're just gonna hate it because they're gonna lose a few seconds here and there all the time. Uh, KU man, same size dish, 64 megs, 99.9% .9 reliability. Uh, your C man service, you may get uh, four and a half or even five nines, uh, but you only get 16 megabits per second because you've got less spectrum to work with anyway. Uh, a couple of architectures to think about because this is sort of a place where people think about architecture and this is gonna matter. Um, we've got our basic uh, uh, old school VSAT up and down uh, and some people take two VSATs. It's a very good idea, especially if they're pointed in different directions. You go through different weather in different directions. Uh, you may start to have multimodal uh, configurations where you've got a geostationary uh, primary service and a low earth or medium earth uh, backup service or the other way around. Uh, you may have a multimodal service, which does exist where you have a primary fiber connection and a backup satellite or the other way around. A uh, couple of providers in American Samoa actually use a satellite as their primary and fiber as their backup because the fiber capacity from American Samoa to Hawaii has been full for years. A couple of advanced architectures here. We're starting to get networks where the, you're doing satellite crosslinks. So uh, your signal goes up to one satellite, goes over to another, goes down to an earth station that's well beyond the horizon. Uh, and uh, cloud avoidance uh, for your KA service, where you may have very high rain fade, 
Uh, there are places like Rarotonga where they've installed two terminals on opposite sides of the island connected by fiber, measuring the signal levels from the satellite at all times, handing off automatically between the dishes to pick up the one that has the better signal to avoid the rain because rainstorms do just move in small cells across the cities. When I operated a microwave network in Auckland, I could watch my 23 gig links fade and I could tell you exactly where the storm was going across the city because Nagios would pop up alert, 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 and then they'd go back and yeah, that's how, that's how rain fade works. So considering the architecture, you're gonna have companies starting to offer blended satellite services where they're gonna give you connectivity over multiple modes of satellite. You're gonna have different capacities on these connections. You're gonna have different levels of availability. You're gonna have different latencies. You may actually have rapid latency changes with some of your services. How do you make this work? Um, heck, there were a couple of research groups I sat in on yesterday where they're thinking about these problems and, uh, and may come up with a solution. So um, lots to think about here. Now, three representative commercial ventures here. Uh, number one, we've got NBNCO, that's Australia's national broadband uh, network company. And the one thing that they've done right is they bought a couple of satellites a few years ago. Everything else they've done wrong. But a couple of years ago, <laughs> sorry. The Australians in the crowd know what I'm talking about. A couple of years ago, they, uh, they launched uh, two Space Systems Laurel satellites, 67 and a half gigabits per second. Look at the engineers in this picture and look at the size of those dishes up there. This is unfolded and, and the dishes are beaming down. Anyway, each of these satellites, 67 and a half gigabits per second, 25 meg down, five meg up to end users, um, balanced across 10 earth stations. It is KA band, so the people that live in the far tropical North Queensland, Darwin, they hate it because it rain fades. It's just awful for them. But everywhere else in the, the dry bits of Australia, they love it because it's, it's really fast. It's kind of laggy. They know it's satellite, but it's much better than what it was. Um, expected lifespan until 2030. And uh, NBNCO does expect to increase the speed to end users to 50 megs down in the pretty near future. Now we've got another one. Look at this satellite here and look at the people next to it. Sort of compare those drawings. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, this one is a MEO satellite, and uh, it's operated by O3B, the first real MEO broadband network ever launched in 2014. They're a carrier, uh, I want to say wholesale only, but they sell the oil rigs and cruise ships too. Um, but they only sell one product, which is big, fast, fat access pipes. Um, and you basically need to be buying a minimum of 600 megabit per second for them to care about you. They will take one of those satellites and they'll beam it down to you. These satellites whiz around the earth. Uh, if you take an O3B service, you actually need to have two antennas. One of the antennas is in service and tracking a satellite as it whizzes across the sky, while the other is hunting for the next one to come over the horizon. They do the handover with BGP, which is just bizarre because it's a bit slow, <laughs> but it does seem to work. <laughs> Anyway, they've got 144 gigabits per second of capacity online. They've been so popular, they've ordered another 96 gigs of capacity. Um, there is KA band and there is rain fade, even with people with four meter dishes, hence the whole multiple terminals and fiber between them and cloud avoidance. Um, don't try and run this in a tropical area with 2.4 meter satellites. You can ask um, Solomon Telecom about that if you want. Okay, last one, OneWeb, this doesn't exist yet, and really we don't have any low Earth orbit network, broadband networks yet, but um, gosh, we're about to have three of them, and there are a few other uh, people who put into the FCC for permission to launch these networks. Um, OneWeb has gained a bunch of investment from companies like Virgin, uh, companies like SoftBank. SoftBank put a billion dollars in last year. Um, met somebody from SoftBank, last week and they said, yeah, it was a small investment. Anyway, uh, they're looking at putting up these little satellites into low Earth orbit, uh, 700 plus of them, and each one is gonna have about six gigabits per second of capacity. So they're building a 4.2 terabit per second network to service rural and remote people. Nice. Uh, Intelsat plans to offer blended offerings combining this uh, low Earth and their existing geostationary assets. Uh, imperceptible latency um, yeah, consumer focused, uh, and it's KU band, so it is not going to have the fade problems of KA band. In fact, you should expect to run this off of a, an antenna 
that is maybe 600 mils. A company called Kaimeta has made an antenna, especially for OneWeb, that is built into the roof of a car. So neat stuff going on. That is it. I only had 12 minutes. Um, this is a 45 minute talk. <sighs> um, <laughs> there's a couple of versions um, online. There's one I did at APNIC in Taichung last year, one I did in New Zealand last year. Fortunately, the Osnog talk uh, was not recorded because I swore a lot in it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, there's a Q&A at the end of this, uh, and of course, you can come up and pepper us all with questions. Thanks, thanks for your time, guys. Okay, so now we are going to take questions, question and answer for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, Q&A, anybody? Yes. <laughs> oh, no, okay. <laughs> Go easy, Anna. Yeah, uh, Dan Bogdanovic. Um, three very interesting uh, presentations. Um, I'm really was uh, interested to hear about the satellite and the speeds up because I started my career, among others, in the satellite communication, and having a 1.5 megabit connection was a big deal back in the early 90s, and that was a three meter antenna in order to get that, uh, and the per minute was insane, uh, but. Um, the cost per minute was insane. But what I'm really interested in was the spectrum sharing. Spectrum is one of the most expensive and most underutilized resources that are out there. And many of them are lying dormant. And I was really, when you were mentioning, you were mentioning many about the software-defined radio, but you didn't mention much about uh, spectrum sharing and uh, where you have some mechanisms in order that you can get the dynamically allocated spectrum and what is developing there. You mentioned a little bit T-Vision, but they are just, you know, uh, TV white space, sorry, TV white space, yes. Uh, but uh, I would be really curious uh, to hear more because I know FCC was looking into that uh, in order to make it more popular, but they haven't followed up lately. Okay, thank you. So Steve, shared spectrum. Yeah, I, actually, when uh, when I mentioned software, I, I didn't mean software-defined radio, although that is also very exciting. I meant software management of uh, of spectrum. Um, so the, the the two interesting areas, one is is TV white space spectrum, which has particular application in sub-Saharan Africa because all of that spectrum is virtually unoccupied. So there's hundreds of megahertz of spectrum that could be used. Um, and the other uh, interesting space is the CBRS band uh, in, in the US that is being promoted by Google. And both are basically the same idea, is using a geolocation database to dynamically assign spectrum uh, based on an availability map that's calculated uh, on, on the terrain and, um, and available frequencies. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be using these technologies. I mean, the, you know, um, Auctions are incredibly risky strategies for, for regulators, as, as I pointed out in, in, in my talk. They're not turning out well, especially in, in markets where, where there, there are limited resources, but they're too attractive in terms of a kind of financial windfall to get away from. But if you were, if you were thinking about spectrum regulation from a risk management point of view, that would be a really dumb investment to like put all your eggs in, in, in one basket. And dynamic spectrum uh, regulation is actually fantastic because it's it's a secondary use of the spectrum. So you're not committing yourself to uh, to the um, the spectrum use. You're just allowing it to win if it if it wins. So the risk to the regulator is very very low, and 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 it's a bit like Wi-Fi. You know it, 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 that that the opportunity to to succeed is there. The problem is that. Um, it gets a lot of pushback because it is a potential game changer if if it takes off. And so the mobile network operators actively uh, discourage its use. The ITU, for reasons which I can only imagine as industry influence, actively discourage its use. Um, so uh, this this technology, which has been available for, for years now, is um, it lies unused and, and there are manufacturers waiting for a regulatory signal to, to ramp up. But in the U.S., FCC was really trying to push it through, and I don't know, it, like in 2014, 15, they were trying to push, but was it, because that's also a political issue. 
Thank you for that. Policy. And actually, I think we need to skip over to the next speaker over here. And thank you, Steve, for that. So um, to my left, your, uh, to my right, your left. Thank you very much. My name is Abdul Karim. I'm from Nigeria. And I'm glad that we are having this type of discussion in this room. Because when I look around, I look at people that look like me. I don't find a lot of us like this. And a lot of the issues that have been discussed this evening actually affect people from where I come from, Africa. So I'm glad that we are having this type of discussion. And I went, I'm glad, especially with Steve, with what he has done and what you guys are doing. And looking at the examples of satellite communication, my problem is satellite generally is expensive. Mm. So I'm thinking is satellite really one of the solutions we can look at? My question is, have you looked at something like IoT2 platforms? as an alternative to satellite. Thank you. John, I think you said IoT, correct? HAP, IoT2 platforms, which is... High alt HAPs, sorry, yes, high altitude HAPs. platforms. Go for it. In the longer version of my talk, I um, discuss a few high altitude platforms, but um, so far there has not been a lot of success. Um, I have watched the Loon project, which started in New Zealand a few years back uh, quite closely, and they really haven't achieved the um, speeds to end users um, or the economics required to make it a viable platform. Um, Facebook's Aquilo was uh, was great for a while until it landed, um, and uh, Google had a, another high-altitude venture that they purchased, and uh, that also looked great, and they shut it down last January and moved the engineers somewhere else. So um, I haven't seen a lot of success with high altitude platforms. Um, I, I really think the uh, satellite is um, probably more realistic at this point. And I think for many in the room would know this, but 98 to 2002, there was already uh, another, there was a space race then. Yeah, Teledesic, others who were doing the HAPS, uh, Teledesic wasn't doing HAPS, but other platforms like that. So it's just the second generation of a, of a race in the middle. Hi, my name's Aaron Falk. I currently work for Akamai. Um, I was part of that first space race. Um, I worked on uh, uh, Spaceway, Astrolink, uh, TSAT, which was an Air Force program. Uh, I followed Teledesic closely. And um, most of those systems were never put into service. Um, and the decision was ultimately uh, around a business model. And the, the problem was for these K-band systems, especially with onboard processing, that they're very expensive, and they're very expensive to launch, and um, and when you have enough users in one place that you can make money off of a satellite link, somebody will dig a trench and drag a fiber over to it, or now they'll put in a base station, right? Um, but that was the problem then. So uh, clearly, launch costs are dropping, but I'm wondering, you know, are uh, do you believe that? Um, the economics of uh, satellite communications have changed substantially enough to support a uh, 700 satellite LEO system. I think they have changed significantly because um, not only the competition in launch with um, SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin coming up and uh, Virgin attempting to replicate what Orbital ATK have done with the airborne launch uh, coming down the pipeline, but the cost of manufacturing satellites has just gone way down. Um, and the speed at which you can manufacture a satellite has gone uh, way down to the point where OneWeb are building two satellites a day. You think about how long it took um, Space Systems Laurel to build the geo satellites for NBNCO, like years. And here we are with LEO platforms building two a day. Um, there was a, a bit of a scandal a few weeks ago. Somebody launched some microsats. Some Seattle startup launched some microsats out of India. And I mean, these things are working, much to the dismay of the FCC and everybody else in the world. They built something in their workshop. They launched it into space illegally, and they're actually transmitting radio signals from it. So yes, the costs have gone down uh, of everything. So I think we're we're not going to have quite the collision. I don't believe that all five of the Leo ventures are going to make it but I'd say three of the five easy. Thank you. And I think I'm getting signals from the floor. Are... Yep. Over here. 
Hi, Mark Nottingham. Uh, John, uh, you mentioned very briefly uh, uh, satellite to satellite communication and, and building a mesh up in space. I was wondering if you could talk about the technology used for that and, and, and tell us a little bit more. And also, uh, giving us a sense of, you know, where are we going to be at, do you think, in three, five years? How many satellites, you know, how pervasive is access by satellite going to be with these new LEO networks? Okay, so really what Mark wants me to do is start talking about space lasers. Yes. <laughs> we said we weren't going to do that, but. <laughs> because in all honesty, we are going to see some optical cross-linking of these satellites, and there's actually a MEO platform um, that's uh, well into being funded that is going to do optical um, Earth to space links to. Um, there is going to be a lot of uh, laser cross-linking, but funny enough, since my talk at Osnog last year, there's been a huge race in V-band uh, cross-linking and a couple of new V-band constellations planned basically just to do cross-linking because V-band is useless for going Earth to space uh, unless you're in a desert. But uh, up out there in the sky, there's nothing to attenuate your, your V-band, which is basically millimeter wave. Uh, microwave. So they're going to build these V-band overlays. In terms of number of satellites, we've got like 15 or 1600 uh, uh, operational communication satellites now. And I'd say within five years, we'll be up uh, an order of magnitude. Um, it really will go that fast. Like people have booked their SpaceX launches. Um, Iridium just put Iridium next up. I think they've launched 60 satellites in the past year. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the volume. We're looking at like 10 to 20 satellites per launch and a huge increase in launch and it's all comm satellites. So we're gonna have a lot, a lot, a lot. Thanks. Thank and you. space lasers. From lasers to across the room. My name is Ignacio Alvarez Amelin. I am Tech uh, Fellow from the ITF. Um, I would like to ask about the community networks um, because uh, Perhaps was very very short the, the, the time that that give to you, but um, what about the certain um, certain proposal like uh, Barcelona Libre, Buenos Aires Libre? It was a, a group of uh, like hackers of uh, Wi-Fi that tried to 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 provide uh, this kind of uh, access. Uh, but uh, what about the the, the 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 names on this kind of uh, I, I mean if you know how many are or more data about that so one thing I would say is that there is a forum called battle mesh where they do a lot of hacking of mesh uh, standards and if you want more data I can give it to you later about that people do get together to hack some of the technology but I would ask Leandro, there's an initiative among some of the community networks right now with something called Libra Mesh, Libra Router. Could you tell the group about that? Yeah, I think the, the difference or the defining factor about community networks is, is not that they just not focus on, on getting the connectivity, but uh, in finding uh, other ways to, to do it and in develop software and explore options. Um, so, so yeah, there are there are many initiatives. Particularly, there is one that is developing um, um, a, a new meta distribution for for co community networks. It's called LibreMesh, um, and and that builds on a lot of contributions from many communities all over the world. Um, but I mean, yeah, yeah, there, there are so many so many groups, so many uh, forums, and uh, as I said, the good thing is that they're on, on their way. They are experimenting with the technology. They are creating new technology, new ways, and sharing information in many forums, and and that's like uh, very promising because I mean many of the, for instance, many of the mesh routing protocols that are nowadays came up with from experimentation, and um, and yeah, the button mesh is one of them. But there are there are many other groups uh, around. So if you are interested, we can give you some pointers. Thank you. There's also a group called the Association for Progressive Communications. Steve works closely with them, and we just held two community workshops in Geneva two days ago. <laughs> um, we were there for another meeting. But we are potentially in uh, the Gaia group going to try and put together either an informational, and Greg Wood always keeps me straight on this, it's either an informational or a, 
uh, an RFC that we could put together, um, a doc, it's not an RFC, but an informational document about community networks, which could include some of the data that APC is putting together. They're doing an analysis of about 60 different community networks around the world. So stay tuned. Um, pardon? So we're gonna cut the lines. We did cut the lines, Brian's helping me here. So <laughs> forgive me if I, I don't have it all down. I'm gonna go to the set, oh, hey, Paul Wilson. Paul from, <laughs> Paul from uh, Yeah, I've got a, a, another question for John on the satellite um, track, but hopefully it's one that also is relevant to, to Steve. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by these flat panel uh, antennas on the ground side and wondering if, um, you know, by avoiding all the hardware and the tracking and all that stuff, uh, whether there's a, whether they're a game changer in terms of the cost of delivering, receiving and having a satellite uh, station on the ground on account of the different the different hardware. Just wondering if that's a game changer that might sort of have some impact on the issues that Steve is raising. Thanks. I have a feeling the flat panel antennas are gonna be quite expensive uh, to start, a lot more expensive than just a stamped aluminum dish. Um, I will take this opportunity to uh, thank Paul and APNIC uh, because it was uh, APNIC and the ISIF program who got me researching networks in the Pacific, uh, which is what introduced me to all the carriers using these new KA band technologies like O3B and really gave me a great perspective on their problems with weather and their problems with capacity and how these things are going to be solved. Uh, thanks. thanks, Paul. All right, well, thank you very much. We know there are more questions. The guys are here for the rest of the week, and if you want to tune into Gaia tomorrow, it's at 13.30. Um, you can check it on the app on the schedule. But just let's give them a round of applause for the excellent panel. And thank you. So we're going to invite the IAB up on stage. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the IAB chair is going to invite the IAB. I'd like to remind you that you, you, you outgoing members of the IAB have not escaped yet. We'd like all of the IAB incoming, ongoing, and outgoing up on, up on stage at the moment. One member of the IB who unfortunately is not able to join us tonight is Robert Sparks. Uh, he's recovering from uh, a series of surgeries and uh, we, we wish him the best and a speedy recovery, but unfortunately he's not able to be with us either in the room or online tonight. So, um, As you can tell, the IB is very concerned about queuing theory. and not so good at spread spectrum technologies eventually. Um, Gabriel, would you start by introducing yourself? Gabriel Montenegro, IAB. Melinda Shore, IAB. Hello, Joe Hildebrand, outgoing IAB. Suzanne Wolf, cheerful and outgoing. Well, actually staying IAB. <laughs> Yariako, IAB. Heather Flanagan, uh, not IAB at all, but RFC series editor. Eric Nordmark, IAB. Lee Howard, outgoing IAB. Ted Hardy. Alyssa Cooper. Brian Trammell, IAB. No, uh, Jatan Siro, IAB. Christian Uitema, because you need more guys with a funny accent on the IAB. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share. Mark Nottingham, IAB. Martin Thompson, white guy. Uh, Alison Mankin, IRTF chair. So the mic lines are open for your questions to the IAB, um, either in person or from our online 
guests. It, it's Pete Resnick. Um, and one that I am hoping what you say is, oh, that's the IASG's problem. Ask them later. Be prepared. So a few months back, I sent the IASG a message asking about the state of the RFC series, who gets to be an author, who gets to be a contributor, who gets to be on the front page, who gets to be where, when, who, how. And they said, yeah, we'll think about that someday. Um, since the RFC editor is under your purview, is this a question for you guys or because it's their stream, it's a question for them guys? So the rules for that are made up on a per stream basis. So if you are thinking about a standards track RFC, it is indeed a question for them guys. However, I'm also going to turn to Heather because she has guidance in the RFC uh, style handbook. Style uh, guide. Style guide, excuse me, uh, on this point, which many stream uh, managers take quite seriously. Um, many of them do. Uh, some of them really wish they didn't have to uh, and would love it for it to be my problem, but this is a, a stream by stream decision. Um, our guidance continues to be, uh, we'd rather see no more than five authors, or in this case, we're using the term authors fairly broadly. That can also be editors. Um, uh, there's a lot of logistical reasons for that I'm not going to get into right now unless you really want me to. Um, we will start to question once you hit seven. Uh, uh, we've mostly beaten the IESG into submission such that uh, we'd often, they'll often tell us in advance, yes, we know we're sorry, um, but we, the so RFC. Let me um, short circuit a little bit because the question is, can contributors who are not on the Auth48, who are not necessarily on the front page, appear in the RFC editor's index so that they can get credit in ways that this community sometimes asks for credit for their publication. Because right now people and contributors do not and they are required to both be on the front page and be in Auth48 if they want that. And if the IASG insists that for their stream they want credit for people and the contributors even if they don't appear in Auth48 and even if they don't appear on the front page, will you fulfill that? The last time that came up with the ISU, this is something I talked to them about annually, because um, we have no memory. Um, they were unable to reach consensus on that. That, that didn't quite answer so, the question. I, I, see, I think, though, that it means your question really does belong with the IESG, if you wish to do it. Ted, can I? Add one, one little thing. So some, some of the tooling that, that we have that, that lists authors um, does take contributors into account and, and some don't. So, so there's, there's always that. So uh, everybody is clustering at one mic. So clearly the interested people in the IEB were leftists, for, at least from the point of view of the IEB. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe from other perspectives as well. Uh, just a comment here, not a, not a question really. Um, since, since Martin kind of teed it up. Uh, so plus one on good plenary topic, I think it was, it was interesting and relevant to this crowd. Um, but maybe minus one on diversity. Um, I, I mean, this, the topic we we're talking about today you know, is, is an important one, um, but hearing it from three white guys is maybe not the best way to address it. As our, as our Nigerian colleague pointed out, as our Nigerian colleague pointed out, there's some different considerations when seen from different perspectives around the globe. And so it would have been nice to have seen some more diverse perspectives on a panel on this topic. Thank you very much. We have a plenary uh, planning program committee and all of the, not quite all of the members are up here, but I believe they're all in the room. Um, and uh, we'll take that uh, advice uh, quite seriously. Thank you. Uh, thanks, my name is Andrew Sullivan. Um, at the DNSOP, meeting on Monday, there was a, an interesting talk uh, by somebody of, about um, ways that maybe that protocol had gotten away from us. And, you know, it occurred to me, listening to it, that, uh, that this is another one of those protocols where we're always talking about ossification, and at the same time, it seems to be growing mostly bone spurs. And I, I, I wonder... Um, I wonder whether there is a thing that the IAB wants to say about that or whether there are things that 
you think you know need to be done about any of these protocols that are at one and the same time critical, kind of in the middle of the the hourglass, and at the same time growing hairs and bone spurs and other kinds of things that might turn into bone eventually or stone or something else. Because I'm just I'm just nervous about uh, about this this being this pattern being repeated, uh, and and then working groups you know still having to work on on the on the protocols and develop them in, in ways that are you know responsive to the to the pressures of, of the internet. As one of the perpetrators of the Dana Sop meeting in question, um, I, I can say that the the challenge there, and I think that was the outcome of the discussion, which which would be worth reviewing. But I think what it, what came out of that discussion in the room was not that this is a novel thought. And I think the challenge there, I would love to be able to come up with something new to say about this about the architectural implications of aging protocols with many teeth and many bone spurs. Um, and trying, but trying to, to, to come up with something to say about it besides, yep, it's self-evidently true and we don't know what to do about it. Um, I, I, I would welcome that. And, and now that you've pointed this out, um, I can go home and think about it some more, but so can, so can anybody else, um, including um, the IAB, because I think you're right. I think that the, we have got to come up with some, we've been having that conversation about DNS and there are probably other protocols we could have it about. And we're, we're getting to the point where the infrastructure and the architecture is aging enough that we should be able to say something about that. And you're right, we don't. I just wanted to point out that Colin Jennings gave a similar kind of talk in art, uh, in the dispatch meeting uh, on Monday morning. Um, so, you know, convergent timelines. Phil? Uh, Phil Han Baker. I'd like the IAB to further consider what expectations we have from users of the internet and how they're using it and how they expect it to affect their privacy. Now, the reason for that is obviously, uh, you may have noticed we're currently approaching a constitutional crisis in this country as a result of people using the internet. And we're approaching weapons of mass litigation. And I think that, and one of the things that troubles me most when I'm reading comments on that uh, debate is when people are saying, well, the users should have expected this because here on page 57 of the terms of service, they signed away their, li their right to their privacy and all their friends' privacy. And so it was settled. And I think that we need to look at what our expectations of users' understanding of the technology is and make some sort of statement because we are facing something that is going to be unprecedented. I mean, you don't do what the internet has just done to two countries without consequences. Christian, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, there is a real problem that as the internet has grown into a big infrastructure for the society, it has changed. I mean, it used to be 20 years, 30 years ago, this wild conquest that we are making of connecting everybody, and, and we were very happy about that. <clears throat> now, we have to go to the next level, clearly. I mean, understand that we have this infrastructure, we have to make it matter, we have to make it more reliable. Now, to Phil's point, there are clearly, I mean, our initial idea was, let's connect everybody, and well, we've been pretty good at that. Now that everybody is connected, we might have to think about what to do to have everybody connected in a useful way. Uh, if you have ideas or specific action that would suggest, I'd be happy to organize that. Yeah, 
I, I, I just wanted to add um, I, all the convert, not all the conversations, but pretty much all the rooms I've been in this week. I think people have been thinking about this and, and it, it's definitely on people's minds. The question is always, how can we help and how can we affect this with what we do here? Um, it, it's, it's, and this goes to a lot of conversations we've had about human rights and other aspects where we're, we're trying to respect the users and trying to uh, further the, the goals of the internet that we, we, we share, I hope, uh, without taking a paternalistic tone or, or trying to do something where we don't have the expertise or, or the authority. And, and that's the balance that I think we're still searching for, is, is finding where we can make a positive contribution uh, without taking responsibility for more than we can chew. So uh, just as a closing comment on this topic, I, I want to point out that ISOC actually hosts uh, policy fellows at many ITFs, including this one. And one of the conversations that those policy fellows have is actually trying to understand the interplay between um, the, the social systems of their countries and the internet as a, as a set of platforms. And I think it's very important that we continue that engagement uh, outside of just the technical circles as we look at these problems, because it's quite clear uh, that some of our own understanding, which might be based simply on how uh, the packets flow or the pieces of the, uh, information traverse the network, uh, that that's not actually capturing the whole problem as it's seen by other parts of uh, the ecosystem. And so I really encourage everybody to remain engaged, not just with ISOC and its policy program, um, but with the, the policy and civil society folks uh, wherever it is you will go home to after you leave London. John? Yes. Keeping in mind that I know we're already over time, I will try to be brief. But apropos of the bone spurs, um, the, the message I heard during that excellent talk was that stuff has gotten beyond the point where the actual, where, where the operators who actually need to use this stuff can understand it. And we're sort of, we have a problem here that we're sort of self-selected to be exactly the wrong people to evaluate that problem. I mean, because, no, 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 because there are operators here, but they tend to be the most sophisticated, the large, you know, it's like, okay, what the ENS operators are, well, you know, Google is here, and Cloudflare is here, and, you know, Domino, and the super, the super sophisticated people are here, you know, sort of the, the random, um, you know, the, the random business that's trying to run a DNS cache on their, you know, on their Windows box probably is not. Now, although I could say, oh, that we just need to get more operators here, you're like, that, that ain't going to happen. But I'm wondering, is there some way that we can figure out that we could like, you know, and perhaps with ISOC's help, figure out some way that we can go and poll the, you know, figure out some way to go and talk to the people who we, who, on whom we will be inflicting our stuff and try to understand better whether they'll be able to use it, you know, and to perhaps, you know, slow, slow down our wild enthusiasm for innovation and direct it more in places where it's going get, to get better uptake. Uh, is this a follow-up question or a uh, follow-up comment on that? If okay, I, please. Yeah, Darren Pettis uh, speaking as a network operator. Um, you know, as many people know, we brought a, a, a proposed internet draft forward on Monday. Um, and, and it's, I don't want to go on and on, it's just that there's a dichotomy here uh, between the need for privacy on the internet, which we completely understand, and a requirement by many uh, operators to manage their networks, um, internal to the data center. And um, not being, you know, an expert on, on these solutions, we tried to follow the process a little bit and come up with some proposed solutions. And I want to thank everybody that's been helpful to throw out different ideas of what can be done. Uh, I've learned a lot in the process. Um, we would have liked to have had uh, maybe an IB architectural board um, uh, review or a, a board uh, meeting for a couple of days to discuss it a little more, maybe understand the situation a little bit better. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there on that, but um, that being said, the situation remains. I know we didn't come up with a solution that was agreeable at the time, which is, is understandable, so we have to figure out how we go forward. But, but as I say, the situation remains that we have to manage our networks, and, and we also want things to be secure on the net internet. So where we go from here, I don't know, but um, just wanted to to share a little bit with that, and if anybody has any ideas of better ways to, to accomplish that and get through that dichotomy, uh, we're happy to listen. 
Uh, so before I turn this over to, to Lee, who's going to be the first to speak for the IB, I just want to distinguish between two different problems, because I believe you, you've elucidated two different ones. One is a problem with management in the face of ossification, a set of systems which have um, gotten so difficult to configure because they're old enough and have um, uh, assumptions built into them from 30 years of uh, different sorts of use that they're not usable in new situations or not extensible in, in particular ways. And then there's a different problem of um, innovation, where we have changed the working of the network in a way that may have an impact on those who use it, who operate it. And I think those are distinguishable enough that possibly we ought to treat them as two different uh, items of inquiry. Um, so when you answer, please be clear as to which one of those ta problems you're tackling. I actually think that I'm being responsive to both because I'm talking more about our processes and, and, and the IAB activities that um, we have been trying to do more uh, more outreach as the IAB um, or as, and with the IESG. Um, we spoke at a recent NANOG um, for DNS in particular. I don't know if there is representation at DNS OARC, but that's not necessarily the kind of operator you're talking about when you're talking yeah, about a yeah, local they're, cache. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're super sophisticated. Right, exa yeah, exactly. That, <laughs> yes, that's a sophisticated yeah. crowd too. Um, so, I, and I don't know how to reach out to, uh, you know, small network operators. Um, I know how to find Darren. I can, you know, I know where he, he's right there. Um, but I don't know how to reach, I don't know how to reach people who, who manage a small network and uh, don't go to conferences and may not read the, the same trade journals that I do. And I, so there, that's, I think that the, the, the IA, I, I'm going to speak for the IAB since I'm leaving and they, <laughs> they can't fire me. Um, <laughs> No, I, I think there's interest on the IAB in continuing. We could make you stay. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's interest in continuing to find ways to do that kind of work to make sure that we incorporate uh, uh, more stakeholders' uh, perspectives as we're developing systems here at the IETF. And I don't think that's limited to the IAB. I think it's also represented on the IESG. Um, that's, but there's a, I think we also need more suggestions on how to do that outreach and do so in ways that scale because there's, you know, there are, there are a limited number of us and, and ours. Okay, so I'm going to cut the line at Spencer, um, uh, since we, we are, as you said, over time. Spencer, what, what's your last question? Can I just say one last thing, if I may? Um, one, one idea was that it could be something similar to IPv6, where there's split into an operational side and a maintenance side, because it's very tough for non-programmers to come into a cryptographer session and try to come up to speed on what's going on. Um, so if, if uh, there was an operational side where they could look at the need and then maybe partner with some people on the maintenance side, that might bridge that gap a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Spencer Dawkins. Um, I just wanted to follow on the, the Lee's comment uh, a little bit and just say, uh, you know, I've gone to operator conference, you know, uh, gatherings also, but, uh, but uh, this, this last time at NANOG was a little bit different. We, you know, we had like six or seven people. We had an hour slot to talk about ITF stuff. We had uh, at least 100 people in the room listening to us. It wasn't a plenary slot, but, you know, that was, that was a lot. I'm, I'm thinking that, I'm thinking that I, I, I am sensitive to the part where, uh, those are not the right operators. Um, I suspect that if we had the right question, the conversations with them, we might understand some things better, and they might have a better ability to flow stuff downstream to smaller operators than we do. Um, so just to up level and say, uh, the IB and ISG both have members that are uh, more intentional about contact with the operator community than I've seen in the last four years. Um, and for, for the, I would encourage the community to make sure that we're, we're talking to them about the right things. Uh, it seems like this is a right thing that could be on our list, uh, and I'm pretty sure that there are other right things as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, the next group to come up for open mic will be the IEOC, so if uh, the IEOC could come to the stage and the IEB could... Look at 
And, oh no, I haven't flipped it yet. There we are. Uh, so while the IOC comes up here, uh, I, uh, including the, yes, they're all here. Uh, so I want to apologize uh, to uh, to Leslie and Tobias because I didn't invite them up here. Um, I I messed up the uh, the run of show, so I apologize to both of you. But Leslie is over here, Tobias is over here. We'll do the photographs with the plaques later, just because we're running over time. But again, I want to thank them very much for their for their service. So thank you. Uh, and with that, we'll start over here. And uh, if people can introduce themselves, please. Uh, Leslie Daigle, Escaping IOC. Uh, Ted Hardy, Ex Officio, IOC. I'm still Beyonce. Still Alyssa Cooper. Tobias Godrum, Surviving IOC. Lou Berger, Nom Comment Appointed. Uh, John Levine, ISOC Board, part of the IAOC. Clondine. Kavir Angela. Portia Wensdanley, IED. Kathy Brown, ISOC in IOC. Uh, I should uh, note also, of course, that we are also the members of the IETF Trust, uh, and Kave is uh, the, the chair, so this is also the time for questions for the Trust, if you have them. Uh, and with that, we'll start here. My name is Jian Hanyao. I, I concern about the ITF registration fee increase. When I first uh, joined ITF, uh, the registration fee is uh, around uh, five hundred dollars. Now, will in next year maybe around uh, ten, uh, one thousand US dollars. Maybe after ten, um, after another ten years, maybe two thousand US dollars. I, uh, the, the ITF registration fee is the most expensive fee I have involved many. I. Uh, Internet related meetings. So I saw, uh, uh, f uh, because I, my company uh, sponsored me to join the meeting. So 2000, 1000, 500 US dollar is no problem for me. But uh, if, if we have more than 1000 US dollar, maybe it's block, we block some open source uh, uh, project manager or small companies. To join the because what one thousand US dollar is much to them. It, every year maybe it's three thousand uh, US dollars. So uh, my my suggestion is uh, we we maybe in future do some survey. Uh, so what is the maximum uh, uh, registration fee that the uh, uh, ITF community can uh, endure or uh, accept? So I also also suggest the ITF. Uh, use another financial source. Look for maybe have a ITF uh, discussion how to increase the financial uh, revenue for ITF, but not, not only focus on the registration fee. If registration fee like the tax, more tax, maybe the uh, the community maybe not happy. That, that, that's my uh, suggestion. Thank you. So I'll allow others to go first if they want. No, no, you see, this is what happens if you allow yourself. Um, uh, okay, so. Oh. People are now struggling. Actually, I, I have a, yeah, where, where'd Yao go? I mean, we, when this question comes up, I mean, first, I mean, the, the proposal we're, our current, you know, straw man proposal is to raise the price from seven hundred dollars to seven hundred and seventy and the one of the topics that always comes up is that by the, is that nearly everybody tra nearly everybody travels from far away so there's hotel costs and there's airplane costs and which for most people I think are probably more than seven hundred dollars so uh, one thing I was actually planning to spring on us at dinner tonight was the possibility of uh, of tiered costs for local local attendees which I think might Oh yeah, which. Um, well, I, I'm. What, what actually? What I'm eating, I might as well finish putting my foot in it. Um, we are. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us haven't heard about this. So. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Here, no. Please go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, we're meeting. No, we're meeting in Thailand this fall. 
And this is the first time since we met in China that we are meeting in what would be considered to be a middle income as, rather, as opposed to a high income country. You know, and I could easily imagine there are people who live in Bangkok, you know, and can get and could get to the venue on the bus, for whom a seven hundred dollar fee might be a deterrent. And and we've had, you know, and, and we, we in fact it's not well it's not super well publicized, but in fact you can ask you can ask for fee waivers. But I am, you know, but as we become more international, the, the fact that different people can pay different amounts will, will will be an issue. And I think that particularly as you know. We're talking about satellites and community networks and stuff like that. I mean, to me, I think it's important that we encourage people to participate from countries outside of the kind of the, the traditional G8, G8 countries. Um, so, I think so. The so the actual answer to your question is, you know, we are aware that raising the price is a problem, and the more we raise the price, the more we're, the more we're going to scare people away. You know, and we don't have all the answers. And to the extent, you know, the extent that people can give us advice on how to do it better, I think we would like to hear it. Please. Okay, so while we are handing out the rope to hang ourselves, so let me do that as well. And as an outgoing IOC member, maybe I can be a little bit more uh, relaxed about hanging myself. So you can hit me on my way out. Um, so definitely in all the discussions we had at the IOC, we are always very cautious about increasing the meeting fee. So I hear you. Uh, we are still also faced with the challenge that uh, Beyonce raised before uh, be between the gap of what we have as income and the gap we have uh, towards the cost. Um, there's a number of things that we can debate or discuss in the community. So one is, for example, uh, can we get more sponsorship money or other sponsorship revenues? Should we expect ISOC to pay more? I mean, ISOC is already paying a lot more compared to some years ago, but maybe, I don't know. Yeah? Uh, is there something to discuss about remote attendees? Should they also care some of that? Uh, these are all discussions, I think, for the community to have at some point. The only thing I would say in addition to that is that um, we need to look at the financial picture as a whole. So meeting registration revenues is one, one source of revenue, but we also have um, sponsorships. Uh, and we're looking at some innovative ways to, to um, formulate those for IETF 103 in particular that, that John raised um, to try and work with sponsors to help make it possible for more locals to attend. Uh, but there's lots of other ways that you could think about um, managing the, the proportion of the budget that is divided between um, sponsorships and meeting registration fees and, and the proportion that comes from ISOC. So I agree with, with the notion of um, you know, sending us your ideas in that regard, but I think it's important to not look at it just in a vacuum. Uh, and I'm going to cut the mic lines just in case anybody um, else has some bright ideas up here. O only the people who are standing are going to get, um, get hits at that. Um, but the last thing that I will say about this is that, um, as I said in the, in the earlier uh, part of the, of the program, uh, we are not promising you um, this increase. Um, this, is, this is a warning now so that you can budget for it just in case it comes, but that doesn't mean we're going to do it. And as you can already tell, we're going to have lots to talk about at our retreat in April, and we'll definitely be reporting back to you as soon as that is done about um, you know, what, what we're thinking about. Also, if you have bright ideas about what we ought to be doing, please do send them to us, right? We, we want those ideas. So, um, you know, we're not foolish enough not to listen. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go over here first and then come uh, back. <clears throat> Barry Leva, and <clears throat> excuse me, part of my voice didn't wake up with me this morning. Uh, I have a comment on the respectful behavior topic that Alyssa brought up earlier. Thank you for bringing it up. There's a point about it that I think deserves highlighting. Um, we are often abrupt to each other, we're often rude, nasty, whatever, on mailing lists or in person. And what I hear often in response to being called on that is, they can take it, they, they, they're long-term or they're long-time participants, you know, we know each other. Uh, or sometimes even, I really don't care if that person's a jerk, I really don't care if I drive, drive him away. But we don't consider that there are 10 other people watching this exchange saying, I don't want to 
put myself in a position where I'm treated that way. And this is not just theoretical. I've had more than one person, I've had more than a few people tell me that they either left or didn't participate because they saw how other people were treated. So even if you think the people who are having this discussion are thick skinned, it is affecting other people and we need to not behave that way. Thank you. So Barry, I, I think your point is well taken, but was there an action for the IEOC there? I could have chosen either the IAOC or the IASG to make this comment to, I chose you. It's a comment and it's something I think we all need to think about, so. Okay. Kyle Rose, um, I want to call the IAOC's attention to a grave injustice and that was the, uh, the lack, the shortage of cookies or as the English call them, biscuits. Um, I'm just wondering what you guys are going to manage to do next time to make sure that there's enough sugar to keep us all, you know, awake and working. You have to talk uh, a lot. <clears throat> you have to talk a lot faster if you're going to complain about cookies. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to point out actually that the next time uh, the um, the ITF meets together, we're going to be meeting in in Montreal, which is in Quebec, and Quebec is the maple syrup capital of Canada, and there actually <laughs> there there actually is a strategic. There's actually a strategic maple syrup reserve in the province of Quebec. So, um, so I think that's what we're going to do. Yeah, I just want to make sure that you understand the gravity of the situation, right? I mean, I was reduced to buying cookies with cash, like some kind of peasant. We, we are sorry about the lack of cookies. I, 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 I understand uh, that, um, that there have been, on occasion, uh, various views about um, the, this venue and uh, the way that we interact with it. Uh, and I think that we will look seriously at, uh, at this venue. There were the last time, and I will say I was on the IOC uh, the last time when, when the decision to come back here um, arose. Uh, and cookies were on the list of complaints the last time too. And we thought we had um, ironed out many of those difficulties. Um, my impression is that this venue has been better for us this time than last time. Uh, you may um, decide for yourselves whether that is um, an acceptable answer. Uh, uh, but I, 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 you know, I recognize that some people have faced some challenges here. I will note that um, there have been some improvements in the uh, in the food handling. Uh, it appears to me that there has been some effort to uh, to label things a little better, and I think that that is mostly down to Mary Barnes. Um, uh, but I recognize that uh, I recognize that there have been some cookie shortages. Yes. Quick plug. Um, so. The Secretariat sends out a meeting survey after every meeting, and while um, you know threads on the attendees list are useful for collecting ad hoc feedback about uh, the venue and any other aspects of the meeting, uh, the structured feedback that we receive in the survey is uh, a really valuable source of information for us. It's really hard to make decisions in a vacuum about what we should do in the future. So if you have opinions about how you thought the meeting went um, or the venue itself, um, they tailor the questions specifically each time uh, about particular things. Um, please fill out the meeting survey. So I will note that I cut the mic line. Uh, so it better be really urgent. Right? And uh, so, so you'll be you'll be fourth. Please. My name is Mukam Taman from Avenik. Um, first of all, let me begin by acknowledging that the financial sustainability of the ITF should always come always take a priority over everything else. Uh, however, at the same time, we do realize that technology very quickly takes up the character of the people that help create it, which is why I think the, the goal to have a lot more representation, geographical, racial, you know, also um, gender is also important. And when we talk about the total cost of attending an ITF meeting, for a room like this, there's a cost that most of you don't ever understand the cost of getting a visa. It could easily be as high as 500 US dollars to a thousand. That's for someone coming from, you know, so very far off. So I want you to have those things in mind. So once you raise, choose to raise the fees, please do consider what does that mean for your strategy to also have what? A lot more accessibility because just the fees automatically is going to shut down a lot of people. A good rule of thumb is to just look at that, say, 
what is the average salary of the kind of person from, say, Africa or Asia that you would like to be here? Because if this doesn't get to the point where some engineers, say, in Lagos or in Cameroon, decide, okay, I should be able to go to, this, go to this event and pay from my pocket, then it's always going to be, you know, locked out um, for a lot of people. And finally, I'm going to say, for some of the solutions, the answers are not going to be found in this room of self-selected people. Maybe the IT, I don't know whether you guys are the right people, should think about sending missions where you go to, like, go to the African Internet Summit, go to the Asia Pacific, and have working sessions. What can we do in order to make the ITF, make, the, make, make it possible for you to be more engaged in the ITF? I think the solutions are not always going to be found here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of uh, points in response. Um, first of all, we have, we are, I think many of us very cognizant of the, the visa cost issue and it's something that we um, talk about uh, quite frequently. One reason why we rotate the meetings around to different parts of the world is to try and distribute some of uh, that difficulty for people so that uh, while we acknowledge that not everybody can make it to every meeting, um, if the uh, visa cost issue is prohibitive in some places that it might not be in others um, and fully acknowledging that that does not solve the problem for everyone from uh, you know with every passport but it's one means that we've adopted um, and that we're actually trying to adopt as a consensus item uh, of the IETF um, to try and um, spread some of this cost across the meetings over the years so that um, if you can't attend one time you can attend another time um, and just in response to the your second point um, so the IETF itself uh, is all volunteers. We can't send people anywhere because we don't really have the means to even cause people to come to, the, to our own meetings. Um, ISOC does have uh, programs that are uh, involved in trying, in trying to get people to participate in the IETF and to do outreach in various parts of the world. Um, and it's something that we could look at, um, that we do look at uh, uh, collaborating around. Um, but for the IETF itself, uh, you know, since everybody's a volunteer, we can just ask people to do things. We can't make them do them. Um, and that's definitely something that, uh, that I at least experience every day of the job. Um, trying to get volunteers to do things is pretty challenging. Lee Howard. Uh, Andrew, during your uh, earlier presentation, you had mentioned that uh, when we have a shortfall in the past, um, ISOC has covered that shortfall on an ad hoc basis and that can't continue. And I wanted to ask why. I don't understand. Uh, well, um, I, I think what I said, I, it, it's possible that I did say it can't continue. Um, I think what I meant uh, in any case is I'm not sure it should continue. Uh, and uh, I, I don't control ISOC's budget, of course, so I can't actually speak for um, what ISOC should do. Uh, yes, but I control the, the part of, uh, you, you know, I don't control anything, to be perfectly honest <laughs> with you. I barely control my mouth. Um, but, but, but uh, you know, I, I'm part of this body and we have responsibility for our budget and we're, we're trying to stay within our means. The, the, you know, there is this danger that if, if uh, we continue to rise, uh, that we, we have the opposite problem of, of what we've just been talking about. That is, we, you know, our expenses start to get away from us. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, the, the final thing that I would say is um, I am concerned about about having this this um, th this way of operating where we like come up with all the stuff that we want to do. We talk that up. Um, we figure out how much money we got, and then we go to you know our our parents and say you know can I have the car. Um, I think that there's a certain responsibility to live within uh, within our means and to understand why uh, our budget works this way. Some of this is structural. That is, we've moved some things onto the budget um, that were things that we were getting for free and not accounting before. And so there have been changes there. Uh, and this is part of the reason why I think the IOC has to spend a good, long, hard look at this and try to figure out exactly what's going on. But I would like to have a model for what our meetings are doing and the fact that we can't really explain 
I, we've got theories, we've got all kinds of explanations, people can come up with them, they're plausible ones, but I don't think we have a really good idea as to why the meeting uh, revenue has, has been changing so much. And I think that if we don't have that, um, it, it's unreasonable for us to ask the, you know, the wider ISOC community to just pay whatever it is that we managed to come up with. People are gonna to start to ask us, well, what are you doing um, with, you know, with these unpredictable expenses? And I think that that's part of the, part of the reason. I don't know if Kathy wants to say anything more about the budget itself. So I think someone said it earlier about uh, taking a, a look at the, the whole of the, not just the business model as to who's supporting what, although we've gone through this a number of times, because there's basically three uh, streams of revenue, right? Uh, registration fees, sponsorships, and then the ISOC piece. And I think that's okay. I mean, the point is when you see this kind of strain on the way things are, it's worth looking at it across the board. I don't think there's any yes, no, or, or even maybe here, there's a, a desire by all of us to get hold of what the actual costs are, why, and, and I think while some of the costs got moved, I think it's really about the attendance. And I think that that issue is one that deserves some attention because that's, I think you put it up on the slide, right? That's where you're seeing this gap. And so I think the collective thought was, well, it should be examined as to what's going on here. So uh, just to, to follow up on that a little bit, I think that the concern here isn't only about the money flows. It's about whether or not it's signal that what we're producing isn't of value uh, to the, uh, the folks who we're producing it for. And if the reason that we're having um, lowered attendance is because the online mechanisms have gotten better and uh, remote participation is successful for uh, people who might have previously come for one or two, um, that's not a... a a statement of the value of the ITF, and it means that we may need to change the funding model uh, to not be based on attendance over time. But it, it doesn't say anything as signal to the leadership or to the to the rest of the ITF about whether or not what we're producing is the, the right thing for the value needed by the ecosystem. And I think that the point Andrew was making before about this can't continue is really about it can't continue that we don't have a workable model of how what we produce and the value we provide um, maps to how people interact with the IETF. And developing that model isn't the work of just the IEOC, it's the work of a lot of people, including everybody in this room that wants to be part of it. But I think it's important for us to realize that it's very easy to make up kind of post facto narratives about, well, this one turned out to be too far away and that one turned out to be, yes, in Europe, but during the cold season where the predictions were for Europe in the warm season. And you can come up with very easy explanatory narratives, but they're not a model. And I think we need to understand how to make predictive models of this that actually succeed. And if it turns out the predictive model for that says, hey, you're gonna to continue to produce useful, valuable things, but it's going to go to all online by the end of some particular time, then you know we've got to, to develop completely new funding streams that deal with that. That's okay. But we can't tell whether that's what's going on or applicability isn't where it was when we were in the midst of the RIE boom or the SDN boom or some other previous boom. And that's really, really important for us not to hide by taking it to ISOC and saying, make us whole. Andrew, could I add one more thing? So, so Leslie's first. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks. So I, I actually don't want to speak to the why can't ISOC just pay all of it? Because I think if you want to have that discussion, you need to go to the IASA 2.0 meetings. Um, <laughs> But I do want to speak a little bit more about this model question and some work that Lou has been spearheading in the finance committee um, to actually have a look at, well, what is what is the actual model of, as Pete Resnick calls it, or no, it's Elliot Lear calls them, gizendas and gazoutas, right? 
um, what what are our in, inbound flows of money and what are our outbound ones. And one salient thing that I would pull up here is that a decade ago or more, meeting fees covered more than the cost of the meeting, and now they don't. Um, and that difference is largely a function of, it's not just our costs that are going up, but the costs of you know hotels and whatnot and food, et cetera. So, um, it is a it is a bit of a tricky business. It is it is challenging to get a, a picture of, you know how how does our financial model work, um, and how would we like it to? So I I think I I presume that the uh, IAOC when it comes back with a statement about whether or not it's raising meeting fees in the future will also come back with a statement of this is how our financial picture looks and this is why we have to raise meeting fees as opposed to getting more money from ISOC, as opposed to expecting to get more money in sponsorship. And uh, last thought, just to show you just how squirrely this, this attendance thing is and how it does tie with what is the work being done. Um, when we were looking at the early numbers of paid registrations for this meeting, this one right here, like three weeks ago, it was the lowest curve ever. Um, and it, it was, you know, we have all of the graph with all of the lines going up like this. Um, and then this this meeting was doing this. And it was like, uh, it was going to be a sub 1,000 person meeting. And as you saw on earlier slides, here we are, 1,200 people um, missed, the, missed the prediction by 40 people. So uh, some of this is just tricky, hard, and subject to uh, new, new good work being introduced to the agenda. So just one last thing as you're uh, contemplating all this, I heard at least two of our colleagues from Africa talk today about um, the needs of people in those nations. And we hear at ISOC a lot of actual interest in people in the other part of the world where there is not an internet yet, that would be 40% of the world that we're hearing from those folks that, hey, we'd like to create too, we wanna to be part of this. Part of what I wonder is whether there are new demands that we're not looking at that would be served in different ways that perhaps result in some different cost structures. And so I, my, I raise my hand saying, I sure hope as you take this issue up that that is part of the discussion and that the, um, testing what those new markets are for the IETF, I think would be really smart. I know that the, my last trip to India, all of everybody wanted to say, how do, we, how do we get there? How do we do this? We can't get there from here financially, but why don't you come here? Well, are there other ways to actually attract uh, more attendees? And so I would hope you would put that in the if in your model now, uh, or a new model, um, and I hope that would get in the conversation. I want to thank you all for, for, for all those comments and, and, and points, and I do think that looking at the value that the IETF offers to the not just participants, but potential participants does need to be part of that model. And I hope that you will look at that probably with the IESG when you're talking about how do we make sure that we're actually <laughs> providing value. Um, and, and absolutely, as, as Kathy, as you just said, and we've, and we've heard, please make sure we can include, we can be inclusive. And that includes, you know, financial inclusivity. Thanks. All right, um, so there are two things. First of all, I um, uh, have now run two mistakes um, today. So I got one more and then I'm fired. Um, but I run two mistakes today. The, the second one was I did not, in fact, invite uh, Brad and Ken here on to the, the stage so that you could see who they were. Um, so if you would come up here now um, with the remaining people who are willing to do that, I'm going to ask you to come up here while you ask your 30 second question. That's you, Aaron. Yes, excellent. Dear Beyonce, um, so uh, an email went out uh, recently uh, asking for input on a number of potential destinations for um, future ITF meetings. And um, I'm just back from a week in Bangalore. And while most of the days were very enjoyable, um, I have to say that it's a very different, uh, as, a, as a business traveler, it's a very different experience. And so I guess what I'm looking for is a little bit of confirmation that this is not going to be ask for input, collect input, make a decision, but there might be a little bit of chance for some dialogue since I think that 
it is it is different enough from the standard work environment for ITF that it might be good to have a chance to talk about it if you're seriously considering uh, locations for meetings that are so different from our current expectations. So thank you for that, but I hope that you are sending such um, uh, such remarks to uh, to the relevant list uh, to the uh, to the inbox that accepts them. Uh, and I also want to remind you that we uh, have this uh, this new committee that is is tasked with um, with dealing with that with that input, and also uh, finally that you know we do have a, an open mailing list, right? It, the ITF mailing list is, is, is open and we can discuss those things there. But I think that it's very important that people raise uh, issues about you know, what, what the differences are uh, to that committee. We are not going to be able to solve the problem for everybody all the time. Uh, and I think that you know, raising the issues is important, uh, but, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be definitive. And I'm not sure that we can de decide meeting venues uh, with 1,200 of our closest friends on a, on a list. That's a fair point. Yes, please. So um, to the other tone of your question, uh, one, uh, one of the ideas of the meeting venue, both and of asking, reaching out to the community is that we want to reach out early in the process. This doesn't. This is not the last step. This is one of the first steps where we start contemplating about something, so we can receive your feedback early. So see it in that spirit. So, so I've now been the um, the meeting review chair for I think about twenty eight hours. So how's it going? So how's it going so far? <laughs> um, yeah, so I will say. Please send the feedback in through the, the channel we've established. Um, it can be good feedback, it can be positive feedback, where, where you say good things about why we should go to that particular place that I requested input on, as well as reasons why we should be concerned about it and we should maybe reconsider uh, going to those locations. So it doesn't always have to just be bad stuff. Uh, so if, uh, uh, first Ken and then Brad, if you can um, introduce yourselves very quickly and then we'll um, hand the stage over to the IESG. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Ken Boyden, and uh, new to uh, service uh, to this wonderful organization, and I'm grateful to be here. And if I can help anybody, uh, as, as you heard, my responsibility is sponsorship, so I'm happy to interact with uh, anybody um, before I depart on Friday and even after. Thank you. Hello, I'm Brad Biddle, and the new legal counsel. Um, Really am excited also about uh, being engaged. I have huge respect for IETF and everything it's accomplished. And uh, it's kind of a daunting role to step into. Uh, IETF's had uh, incredible legal support over you know, the past number of years with George Contreras. Um, so I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in, in one sense, because there's really been amazing work done. Uh, I really you know appreciate the warm welcome I've had and uh, really love the culture and the people of the IETF. And, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. Thank you. Oh, with that. No, we cut the mic line some time ago, I'm sorry. Um, we're gonna invite the ISG to come up next, please. Thank you. Time for the ceremonial passing of dots.
Go ahead, pass your dots if you if you so choose. <laughs> so let's start down at this end, uh, Spencer. Spencer, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm Spencer Dawkins. I'm the outgoing transport area director next year. <laughs> ben Campbell, continuing art area director. Alvaro Rathana, uh, routing. Kathleen Moriarty, outgoing security area. Ben Kaduk, incoming security area. Martin Vicore, uh, incoming routing. Aliyah Atlas, outgoing routing. Warren Kamari, continuing ops. Alexey Melnikov, continuing applications in real time. Alyssa Cooper. Suresh Krishnan, returning internet. Ted Hardy, ex officio as IED chair. Terry Manderson, internet. Mia Kulivan, returning transport. Deborah Bronger, routing area. Ignaz Bogdanas, incoming operations and management. Benoit Clairs, happy outgoing AD. Ops. Adam Roach, returning applications in real time. Eric Rascrola, security. Okay, my plans are open. I think I can speak on behalf of the ISG that uh, we encourage all questions about space lasers and we discourage all other questions. <laughs> Keep that in mind as you go to the mics. <laughs> I refer my right honorable friends to the question I asked some moments ago. Right, so um, so we sent you a response, Pete, uh, which indicated that um, we thought that the right time to come back to this discussion would be when the new format tools were a little bit further along uh, because we might be able to leverage them uh, to uh, address some of the issues that you raised. So we had, a, we had a lively discussion about it and there were kind of differences of opinion on the topic itself, but it seemed like that's, that would be the right time to take it up again. Uh, what is this? Months. Months, yes, months. Yep, we were just talking about how to, how to phase the rollout uh, on the weekend with the RFC editor, so yeah. Go ahead. So I stood up here last um, ISG, if you remember, and calling the uh, IETF arrogant and how we needed to get the user community together. And I said I would take the responsibility to try to get the group together. Um, and the group that we chose was ONOG because they were interested in talking to IETF people. Um, so we had a comp there was a conference call. I forward mail to the ISG asking people to participate. I wasn't able to attend, so I have no idea if anyone was on that call. Can you comment? We have folks from routing ops. I, uh, so do you know, I know I wasn't able to be on that particular call, but we have been having some conversations about seeing if we could ask some folks at ONOG to come either to, the, to talk at the routing area meeting or RTGWG and do a better overview of what's going on. And we are getting some work coming into the routing area meeting. Uh, sorry, working group that is very related to what ONOG is doing. So I think we really need to continue and build that relationship. So the plan was to get ONOG to come here in London. That didn't happen. The ONOG is going to be held in May. So let's us put our foot forward to get somebody there. So uh, if anybody wants to work on it, um, contact me. Uh, do you know, uh, I'm planning to attend the ONOG meeting in San Francisco in May uh, exactly for this purpose. <laughs> Tobias. Uh, yeah, Tobias. So um, this is related to the NOMCOM comment that the pool of potential future leaders is relatively small. And uh, first question, it's, it's like a one question, so one sub-question. First question is, what do you think you're going to do about it? Because we hear this like every year that, oh, we are facing a relatively small pool of potential uh, new ADs and so on. Uh, and the sub-question is, might it be one option, for example, to be more 
risk taking in terms of choosing uh, younger working group chairs with less experience in the uh, to give them that opportunity to uh, grow and learn and develop in our community so that's one idea and um, I'm sure the new ADs will take that into consideration the security area has done pretty well for the last few years and so we've been trying to share with the other areas what we've been doing in case that helps others maybe it's easier for security or or maybe it's the mentorship um, but we have paid attention to who asks who's interested to eventually be an area director and have tried to work with them on different opportunities whether um, they're very young in their career so we may only have openings for a secretary position for a working group and then um, help mentor them into roles for working group chairs and you know I could name several instances but we have a pretty good pool of more than five people that are interested to do it probably closer to ten that are interested to do it either soon or at some point in time um, so it, it does require outreach from the area directors it requires mentorship um, and you know showing interest in, in building people so I, I do hope that continues and I know um, ben and Ecker are, are interested to continue that, right? And we discussed who was interested so far and hope that the list grows. And we encourage through the sector as well. Oh, yeah? So, yes, we can do a lot in our areas. And I, obviously, Alvaro and Deborah and I have done some of that, encouraging our chairs and appointing new people. But to pretend that this is isolated from the other industry effects and the consolidation that's happening in portions of the industry would be absurd. And I have to note that even when you look up at the IESG, we've gone in the four years that I was on the IESG from having essentially a completely full-time IESG to one where that is distinctly not the case. And so I feel that the concerns that about finding and mentoring good leaders and encouraging the industry is even more critical than it appears. And it's not just those areas. Spencer. Spencer had his hand up before you, Ben. <laughs> I have my hand up. Um, so just, just to follow on a uh, comment I was making from the microphone. Um, I think at this point we're at uh, reprogramming the Kobayashi uh, Maru uh, level of, of needing to, to think about things. Um, continuing to make, you know get up and say, boy, it would be great if there were more and, and uh, more uh, transport uh, nominees for uh, NOMCOM every year for how many in a row. Um, I mean, you know, it's like we, we, we can do better than this. Um, I, having said that, this is not the ISG's thing to fix. It's, I think it is the ISG's thing to make sure that we don't keep the community from fixing. Uh, and it's not the NOMCOM's thing to fix. I mean, you know, they can ask for uh, nominees earlier and that would be awesome. But I think that, we're, you know, I think we're reprogramming a simulator at this point. And, uh, I'm, I'm interested in talking to people in the community who have ideas about that. I do, I'll just say this uh, for a couple of examples. Um, we, we met with the working group chairs today to talk about uh, changes to the way we schedule working group meetings and resolve conflicts between working groups and stuff like that. So the secretariat got up and, and talked about stuff that we talked about with the secretariat at the ISG meeting this morning. And uh, there were probably nine working group chairs that made really good suggestions that we had thought of, I'd say, to be generous, three of them. I think there's a lot of clue out there that isn't up here. And I think that, I think that might be very helpful for uh, the, that part of the community that has that clue to be involved in this conversation. You will notice that everybody on this stage managed to figure out how to get funded to at least start their terms. That's not true for the rest of the community. So we were the wrong people to solve this problem. So uh, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said so far. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted to go on to say that the uh, art area directors and some of the chairs have had a similar discussion this week 
about uh, how we can better grow our pipeline because the pipeline has been pretty thin for some time. That's not just at the area director level, that's at the chair level and all the way down where it's hard to find uh, people that are both willing and capable of filling the roles. So that's something that we are actively looking at. Thank you. Stefan. <clears throat> Stefan Bartmeyer. I have a concern about the approval of on Monday of the draft uh, effects of pervasive encryption on the operators. Uh, the draft describes a lot of awful behavior that some operators are practicing and then say, states that encryption prevent them. And instead of seeing this as a good thing, uh, the draft frames the problem as, as if encryption was a problem because it prevented all the sort of things that operators would like to do. A typical example is section 234, which describes either HTTP header insertion in the HTTP flow when the operator adds personal information such as the phone number as an HTTP header, so the website at the other end can have more information. This sort on also, the draft says that this uh, action, this specific technique, is sometimes seen as questionable. It's not sometimes seen as questionable, it's awful, it's bad. And if encryption prevents it, it's precisely what it was invented for. So I think that this draft sends a very bad message. It will clearly be read, uh, once published as an RFC, it will be seen and described as a uh, going back after RFC 7258 on will be clearly will be uh, discussed and presented as if IETF went back on encryption. Juan, do you want to address that? So, I mean, as I'm sure everybody knows, this document has had a long and varied past. Um, it's gone through multiple IETF last calls, and yes, there's a lot in it that doesn't make everybody happy. Um, but what it is trying to do, and perhaps doesn't do perfectly, in fact, we'll say it doesn't do perfectly, is be judgment-free throughout. You know, we tried, the authors tried multiple times to remove any sort of judgment and just try to be, these are things that people do. By the way, you should know about them if you're going to be running a network. Um, I don't really know what more I can say on that, but I'm sure there are many other folk here who can. Can you speak uh, to the consensus? Pardon? Where we landed on the consensus text that might be a useful um, fact. I can find the, find the draft, but I mean, we published, we clicked the approval thing on Monday. Um, With the consensus bit said to no. That's, that's part. Yeah. Can you, Sorry. Can you yeah. explain the and, implications? Yeah, and it's one of the very, very few documents where, that we've ever published that has the consensus but set to no, um, which shows up differently in the boilerplate. So if you have a look in the data tracker, maybe that wasn't clear. If you have a look in the data tracker, it's got um, consensus no, so it has the different boilerplate on the front of it. Um, once it's published, it will have the different boilerplate on the front of it. So um, I don't think I explained that very well, but <laughs> um, hopefully that helps at least some or Kathleen. to alleviate your concerns, and I'm sure Kathleen has more. Sure, and I'll keep it short. So this was a follow-on from RFC 7258, and Stephen, one of the authors of that, was the original sponsoring area director for this, and he also agreed it was a follow-on, because if you read the words of that document, it is also asking to find a balance and figure out what that balance is between network management and privacy, and, um, and, and to consider those controls. This was a very difficult document to work on because people needed to feel acknowledged in, in what they were being set, uh, what they were contributing and, and feel heard that these were real problems in their spaces and there may be alternate ways to do these things. Um, so I do hope that for uh, areas where you are objecting to practices that you help coach and provide guidance as to what should be done in ways that will be received well. Um, Additionally, we addressed every single comment that came in. So if you didn't send comments in, in the many times that this has been out for review, we weren't able to address them. The other problem we ran into as authors is that everybody is biased, everybody. Every piece of text that came in just about had some bias in some direction. So it was very difficult. Spencer? 
So um, I'm the um, responsible area director for Quick. So um, I've spent an entire IETF meeting talking to people about the spin bit in the halls. Um, so I want to I want to do real quickly two things. One is to say there's there's two things going on here. One is the way we ballot uh, on informational documents. Uh, I had a fairly short but intense conversation with the ISG about that this morning, uh, and that's continuing informational, uh, sorry, informal uh, our chats and, and uh, retreat topic, I'm sure. Uh, but for us to be able to, for, for us to be able to get the stuff out that needs to be out the way it needs to be out. Um, and I think we made some, I think we actually made some progress with that with, with publishing the draft that we've been talking about. Um, but I want to up level to another thing and basically say that, you know, we're talking about a problem that is difficult, it is a tussle, it is, we have managed to not make it go away for a year, and I have no reason to believe that it's going to go away. So I think that this is the point where we uh, need to be engaging with the community, and I think this is the point where we need to be steering, because we need to be able to do the right thing, whatever the heck that is, uh, when we're talking about, gee, we have privacy concerns, gee, we have operational concerns. That's been really difficult. The IAB has had uh, has had a workshop that uh, tried to you know tried to engage the wireless operators and uh, basically you know it's this this is hard you know um, and that you know that conversation hasn't stopped either. So um, I think you know again this is a thing where it's like you know we need help from the community and and we need to be steering. Oh yeah. Um, the work, too, as, as I went deeper and deeper into it, it it's really a, also a control issue between apps and management and security kind of stuck in the middle. And um, uh, <laughs> right, so I know why she got the unicorn. Uh, but more seriously, this isn't something that the IESG needs to solve. This is something that we all need to solve as a community. This is a tussle. This is impacting the internet. This is impacting people out there. And it's a balance between, as Kathleen said, the endpoint and the network. And we've all had the arguments about dumb network and smart network since we were in, well, not preschool, I guess, but you know, at least college. And at the same time, it matters. And we also had that lovely plenary talk with David Clark talking about how one of the things we can do is wait and figure out how to make the stage of the tussle something that considers the ethics and the challenges that are ahead. So the question I have for you back is how do you frame it? How do we pull consensus together out of the IETF? How do we get the work moving along that's needed? Because no matter how fervently we care about the ethics and privacy of the internet and internet users, at the end of the day, folks are needing to manage and run their networks and frankly, make money. So we need to figure out how to balance the tussle and how to do the right technology to solve this. And that I'm afraid is not something that you're gonna find up here because you know, there's so many more brilliant people out there. Thank you. Um. Speaking about the, the judgment-free character of the draft, I don't think that it's a target in itself to be judgment-free. When it sees things like uh, as awful as inserting HTTP headers with personal information or many other examples in the draft, we should not be judgment-free. We should clearly say that it's a bad thing on if encryption stops it, it's good. For the same reason, I'm unhappy with the use of terms like balance. I mean. The priority is protecting the privacy of the users. The rest comes after. We don't try to balance everything. There are some things that are more important than others. So I, as an author, I'm one of the security area directors and there's countless drafts in the IETF that have been published during my term where I pushed for encryption to be required on those drafts. I, I have firm belief that it is helpful to have encryption. Um, we are not gonna reach end-to-end -end encrypted networks unless we address these problems and 
help people understand better ways to tackle these issues. So publishing a draft like this, in my mind, and, and it says it within the draft itself, is meant to be helpful to overcome these obstacles people have to deploying encryption. If you ignore them, they will not deploy your encryption, right? So this was hit it head on. Let's start talking about this and figure out how we can go forward so that we could have end-to-end -end encryption. So yeah, I guess sort of a follow-on from that. Um, simply continuing to say that something is bad doesn't make it go away. And we spent a long time saying that NAT is horrendous, you should never deploy NAT. <laughs> Didn't so much work out well for us. Um, this document isn't saying that you should spy on your users. It's not saying that in any way. Um, the tone, I believe, is these things are things that we need to realize exist. You need to understand that you know there are these middle boxes that do these sorts of things. If you want to have an encrypted network or you know a network where encryption is ubiquitous, you need to understand that these things exist and that if you don't provide some other way for people to be able to do the stuff that they need to to protect their network, they will just not allow you to deploy this. And oh dear. Um, wait, wait, please, please. There's other people in the mic line ahead of you. Um, Aaliyah, did, were you coming up again? Okay. Um, so I just uh, just an observation, which is that um, as Aaliyah said, this uh, the responsibility for trying to figure out exactly what the uh, precise thing to do here on a case by case basis does not lie with us. It lies with the community. I think if you review the extensive record of commentary about this document, you will find both your own view reflected and some of the views uh, that uh, the 80s to my right over here have been reflecting. Um, so this is clearly a point of contention uh, for the community. Um, the same if you review the extensive uh, mailing list traffic on OpsAWG uh, related to the ballots, right? So I think it's, it's not a, a question that we're going to resolve here today, um, and it's not even necessarily a question for the IESG as a body to resolve. We had to, we made a group decision about what to, uh, the disposition of the document based on, you know, many, 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 many rounds of edits, um, but this is really not the end of the story. It's uh, probably, you know, somewhere towards the beginning. I think we should move on if that's, if that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move to this gentleman who's been standing in line extremely patiently for a very long time. <laughs> and then I think I, I would like to cut the mic lines given the time. So, uh, Brett Jordan, um, I just want to publicly stand and thank Kathleen Moriarty for her years of service and her willingness to seek out and understand all sides of an issue. Thank you. Uh, Phil Han Baker. Yes, just echoing that, uh, I was very surprised when Stefan said that the first and only priority is encryption. For me as a security person, my biggest priority is usually integrity and authentication. And for many users, access to their data. If you've encrypted all their pictures of the kids when they're five, and they can't get access to them. That's a much more serious loss to them than the fact that somebody might, else might have seen them. So whenever you are designing a security protocol, if you're not thinking about the balance of the user's concerns, you're failing the user. And one of the three things that has frustrated me so much is that I got into the internet because of PGP. And 30 years later, we're still not using end-to-end -end encryption. And that isn't the fault of the end users. The fault is in ourselves because we haven't yet given them the end-to-end -end tools that meet their needs. And we must understand their needs and address their needs before they will use our stuff. Thank you. Harold. I'll just jump. Seems I get the last word. I don't know. I didn't mean to make you have you sit down if you wanted to be in the queue. So <laughs> if, if, yeah, if I mean, it wasn't clear, okay. it was cut after you. Next, next yeah. the last word. 
Sorry. <laughs> a couple a couple of points on which internet we built. Both universal access and this particular debate illustrate that we want an internet for everybody, which includes that we connect all the good guys and all the bad guys. And some of the bad guys run networks. So, we got to admit that. And we got to say that that's a good thing. Because the internet is for everybody. However, I hope that the ISG will encourage in the future Positions to be stated, not only on what exists, but on what is good and what is bad. So that destroying the integrity of other people's data, whether it's HTTP headers or other things, is condemned as bad, even though we have to make it a separate document in order to, to do a separate consensus call on it. So I commend you for having gotten this far in describing what goes on in an internet that is for everybody. Thank you. Um, so looking at this problem purely from technical um, and not policy or moral or anything, I think it's a simple problem to solve. Every single packet on the internet should be encrypted. I'm looking at this tech as a technical problem as a trade-off between privacy and network management. Every single packet and then the internet should be encrypted. IP headers go in the clear, so network management at least has something in outer headers. They, don't, they can't look at port numbers, but something has to give. They don't have zero management, they have IP headers, but every single packet on the internet needs to be encrypted. You're volunteering to join the Quick Mafia, are you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.